Welcome to Soul Night Live number 50. Tonight, my guests are the legendary progressive rock band Nectar. Well, for starters, today is our 50th episode. So thank you all a million for tuning in and making this show successful. Hey, guys. Hey, man. Hey. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Hey, Sean. Howdy. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, I can see you up there. Hey, Kendall. Hey, everybody. Ron, Rich. Hello, everybody. Well, Nectar, thank you for dropping by and uh, being part of my 50th episode. It's been it's been quite a run this uh, in this past six months, and um, I, I'm really pleased to share this special episode with you all. So, thank you for coming by. Congratulations! Thank yeah, you. Congrats. Thanks for having us. Yeah, my yeah. pleasure. My pleasure. Got a lot of cool stuff to talk about. Um, so, I thought I would we kind of talk about how this lineup came together first, and um, then kind of talk about the new record, and kind of go from there. You got a few new records out, actually, don't you? I mean, the studio album, and then there's also a live one that just came out recently as well. Is that right? It's coming out. No, okay. you can go. Yeah, um, yeah. We just had a, we just put a live uh, uh, one out. Uh, the the band actually got together because of Ron. Um, Ron called me and he he wanted to put a band together, and I said, okay, I'll help you put a band together, and. Uh, it was me and him and Rich, who's here, um, who, set, who went to, to the recording studio first uh, to John's place. And we uh, um, it, we just set it off right away. It was a matter of putting the rest of the band together. And we'd already talked to Randy uh, to be in there. Mick had agreed to come back. Um, so all we really needed was a keyboard player. And uh, I asked Rich about his keyboard player with Flying Dreams, and uh, uh, Kendall uh, joined us. He came to the You should tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> I knew That's it was funny. coming. Yeah, All right. you, you tell. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think Ron came down to see Richie and I play a duo, Flying Dreams duo, uh, just keyboards and guitar um at uh, roxy and dukes um and i came off stage and ron was there he'd watched and uh he said i we're thinking about putting this together would you want to do it and i explicative said yes um that would be of course so a year from then it took a year to get it all together they said learn these tunes and come on down so we went to the studio house um, I think it was a weekend morning, a Sunday probably, quiet suburbia. I packed my car with <laughs> four keyboards, stands, speakers, you know, it was packed. I was going to give it everything. So I put on my gloves. I pulled everything out, found the house, pulled it, put it on the street, all these cases and putting it on my cart. And Marianne comes out and says, I'm so sorry, but they... We won't be needing you <laughs> and turns around and goes back in the house. And this is, you know, Sunday morning, quiet neighborhood, nothing else but birds chirping. So I looked at my stuff. I looked at the house. I looked at my stuff, <laughs> but then they all came out and, gotcha. uh, and they got me. They all came out. And <laughs> it was a great day. Yeah. So we had a great time. And that immediately it started playing when you, it was right. It was the right thing, you know? Um, so we, we dug out a lot of material that we uh, played with uh, me and Ron and uh, Rich back in 78. And uh, we started putting it into boxes, recording part of it, making sure we got something uh, ready to uh, put together. And over the next about a year, uh, we put uh, the other side together. Um, and we took it in the studio last July, July, June, July, July 2018, right? July, no, July 2019, we took it in the studio. Um, and it was great. I mean, it was just, it was just magic. Uh, I think one of the best tracks on there is Drifting. And Drifting was uh, a one take. We just played it. That was it. Um, there is, there's a lot of magic 
with that album. You know, we had a, we had, we felt a lot like Roy was with us, um, especially when we did Devil's Door. Um, we uh, we used the beginning of Devil's Door is Roy's guitar. <coughs> we were listening to it to go into the studio so we get a feel for what we we're doing. It sounded so clear, so crystal clear. We said, we got to use this. So I got hold of uh, Roy's wife uh, in England and I asked her, would she be cool with it? I said, we, we don't have to ask your permission, but we'd like you to be with us. And she said, yeah, let, let, do it, do it. So we did when we, we, uh, we uh, played the beginning from the 1974 concert I think that concert was in Detroit, right, Ron? Yeah, I think so, yeah. 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 And, that uh, tape had a twist in it. It was mine. Huh? That tape had a twist in it. I don't know whether it had a twist yeah, in it. Yeah, it went out in 2005. Great, man. So we, uh, uh, we, we used it. Um, and you, know, you, you heard what it sounds like. I mean, it, it just blended re really, really well. We rented a shore house by the studio, so we sequestered ourselves, you know, just to get away from the world. So we just stayed with each other. We bought a, brought down a Pro Tools system, so we would listen to the mixes, rough mixes at night. And we worked, and uh, we just really immersed ourselves in the whole project. It was great. Well, it's kind of old school, you know, the whole band getting yeah, it's into definitely the old school. Yeah. You know, that's a great way definitely to do it. School. Yeah. Well, yeah, make the mean chicken. Yeah. It sounds it's awesome. great. We're all in one. We're able to bring outtakes back to the house at night, listen to them, and get music ready for the next day. It was just, it was, it was just old school. Everything we did was live. So every track, every basic track was live. Well, that's awesome. Um, and and it feels that way, you know. Um, when we did, uh, um, when we went on tour, we we just put out the Wildly Theater. Uh, which was it in St. Louis? That that's live, and uh, it, the whole tour felt that way. The whole tour felt like it was really honking, you know. Now, where's the best place to get the new live one? Pardon? Where's the best place to get the new live album? Uh, Nectar's Music. Okay. Nectar'sMusic.com. All right. It's not an album yet. It's just a download right now, right? No. Okay, uh, Randy. Correct. Yeah, that's just a download yeah. right now. All right. Okay, what's um, the full title? Uh, the, it's live Japan. at the Wildly Theater. Okay. Yeah. I believe it's right on the, the, the front the home page when you go on there. It's right yeah. there. There's a couple of things to choose from, and that's one of the main ones. Yeah. Okay. Is that, is that? Now, we're actually supposed to be doing a live, which is what we originally intended. We we're supposed to do a live concert at the Bearsville Theater. Um, st uh, next Saturday, the 5th. But, um, you know, one of us was exposed to COVID, although nothing has happened right now. Uh, that's why I'm here. I'm staying with, with Rich and Marianne because uh, we were going to be rehearsing. I, I live in North Carolina now. Uh, so I said, well, okay, we, we're not going to do it. Um, therefore, um, I'm going to stay up here and we're going we're gonna to mix the concerts that we're going to do next next Saturday. And that's what we've been doing. We've been mixing them concerts. We've been working on uh, the Orion. Uh, we're looking at Orion 2 probably by uh, Monday. And uh, we're going to have a look at Prog Stop. And that's what we've been doing every day is just mixing. He's a, he's a slave driver. You know, you, you got to <laughs> live. You, living in the same house, up early and hitting Pro Tools and mixing everything. And it's just, it's, it's really great. It's a cool thing. Yeah, I'm really looking cool. forward to asking you how that's going, Rich. Great. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Your, we'll, your talk, we'll talk later. I'm sure you will. We will. 24-7. Yeah. Yeah, we've been, we've been working no. eight, like ten hours a day. Yeah, so, well, it, it definitely sounds good. I'm, I'm very pleased with what I'm hearing. And Jay was over here today. Uh, brought some more video for us to look at. And uh, the video for from day two at the Orion looks like uh, Woodstock with his, his two, uh, two pictures, you know, you got a, a close up and a, and a distant. It 
really, really it's going to be good. It's yeah. going to be really good. It, it, looks, yeah. it looked like that, like the, like the Woodstock movie where uh, you'd see different angles at the same time. It's great. So yeah. uh, that's going to be great, too. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Excellent. You realize, Sean, you realize this band was formed originally before Woodstock. Yeah, 1969, is that right? We met in the summer before. I was curious, how did you guys meet and how did you wind up meeting in Germany? Ah. You want well, to take this one, Mick? Yeah, well, everybody was gigging in Germany over, over there. Uh, Moe's with Prophecy, with Ron, they'd been a couple since Joe Cocker days, 1964. Yeah. I had the light show. I'd been doing London Roundhouse and then went out doing festivals and I was doing freelance light shows. And we bumped into each other, this little club in Firth in South Germany. And uh, we hit it off right away. They were playing the kind of music I hadn't heard since I left England. And uh, they seemed to like what I was doing as a background with the liquid lights and slides and stuff. And we said, oh, we'll have to get together. And that's exactly what we did about yeah. six months later. Oh. Yeah, Ron and I have been playing together since uh, 1964. So we've been a few years, right, kid? Yeah. Still no gold watch. <laughs> <laughs> it's past yeah, Ron's bedtime. Yeah, we we lot. went through a lot of a lot of uh, things in in our uh, musical careers. Uh, we played the Panathinaikos Stadium in Greece, Athens, Greece, oh, wow. with uh, Nico Masterakis, who was uh, Vangelis, Papa Thanasio, Vangelis' uh, brother. Oh. We used to play, with, me and Ron would go and play with Vangelis. And uh, we got on really well. And his brother put us on at this stadium with 60,000 people. It was, wow. it was outrageous, man. <laughs> now, does that predate Nectar? Oh, yeah, yeah. by many years. <laughs> That's on YouTube, too. It's still on YouTube. That track Sonny on there still? Yeah. 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 Very cool. Very cool. So how did you meet up with the other guys over there? Well, um, let me think. We met Mick it in Firth. Uh, we met we were, uh, Roy in Hamburg. Yeah. yeah. We met Roy in Hamburg. We met. I would met the, Roy independently when he was with the Rainbows and done a light show with him then. So it's. Wow. Well, yeah. Uh, um, okay, and then, you know, we met Mick and said, Mick, you, you, Mick and I had talked when we were in Firth and we talked about putting a music and light theatre together at some point, but we didn't know when. But the idea of Nectar evolved around that time. I think it was August uh, of... Uh, 69. 69, yeah, yeah. And then when we started, we... we uh, the Colin, our guitarist, decided he was going to go back to England. And Ron said, how about, how about Roy? And we said, yeah. And I sent him a telegram. And I said, do you want to come and join us? Um, we'll, uh, we'll play some music together. And he said he'd love to. So I sent him the money, because as usual, all musicians are broke. And uh, he, he came in. We picked him up at the harbor. And uh, I think it was the next day or the next couple of days, we did our first gig. We played, uh, I don't remember what they call it, but it was outside Hamburg anyway, because that's where we were living, in Hamburg. And we just jammed the whole night. We, Do you know this? Yeah, okay, let's play it. And it went down really well. We decided before we did the concert that if the if the concert went down well, we would call it Nectar. And if, we, if it didn't go down well, we're going to call it Pollen because we're going to change it. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, the well, concert went down really well, so we, we called the band Nectar, and we decided on a K because it was harder. It was hard rock, if you like, you know. We didn't, I don't think we realized at the time that that was the German spelling of Nectar, but um, that stuck. That was it. And how did you land on the Nectar name in the first place? Was it just like, you know... It's going to be sweet as honey if we do it right, and it's going to be pollen if we don't. don't know, man. We just pulled it out of our ass, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Some of the best ones. Well, there, was, there was a band called Ambrosia not sure. around at the time, so. <laughs> I don't remember how that went down. I remember 
that we decided on nectar. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, and and we thought it was sweet, and we thought it was it was hard rock, uh, which was K, the K. So now we've got the K back with Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You put the K back in nectar. There you go. There you go. Excellent. So anyway, uh, the one it was late in '69, and we're in the uh, annex of the Hotel Pacific in Hamburg, and uh, Mick rolls in, sticks his head around the door, and he says, "Hey, I'm I'm back." <laughs> we said, "Great. Where's your gear?" And his gear was somewhere. Where's your gear? Was Stuttgart. There? Huh? Near Stuttgart, Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. So we we went and got it, and uh, and we would uh, we put the show together. And when when we uh, we, we had gigs booked, uh, I, I booked all the gigs at the time, and I would say um, we have a light show, and they said, "Well, we have lights." And we said, "No, we have a light show," and they we couldn't convince them that the light show was something they'd never seen before. So I said, "I'll tell you what we'll do." We'll do the light show, and if you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it. And they paid for it every single night because they wanted us back. It was, it was, I, in my mind, Nectar with the light show is Nectar. That, that's the show. Oh, yeah, yeah. They two go together, you know, you can't yeah, imagine yeah. it otherwise. Well, now we have Jay with us. Um, he's, he's with Mick, and they do, they do the visuals. And we've still got Pete Lango. Um, Pete's been with us since 74, I think. Yep. Um, and uh, it's, it's very special. It's very special. The way we're working right now is special. You know, uh, I'm, I'm staying with uh, uh, Rich and Marianne, and Marianne's cooking up a storm, and we're, we're here down the north to the grindstone trying to get all this stuff ready for next week uh it'll go out probably monday or tuesday to all the venues that are going to show it it's going to be shown uh free it's about a two and a half hour show and there's uh pieces from a lot of the venues uh that we played this year uh so it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun i think so is this in lieu of the stream that you were planning on doing Basically, yeah, right yeah. now it is. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Next yeah. year, when we can get out of this COVID mess, uh, we're gonna re we're gonna do it. We're gonna go back to Bearsville and uh, and and do a concert. Okay. Well, that's it's just it's just yeah. really weird right now. Oh yeah. We've not been together in one room since March eighth. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, we're okay. We we're, we're together all the time. Uh, so I mean, I've been here now what ten days. Um, yeah, I think I've been here 10 days, so we're not worried about masks or getting sure. infected. Yeah, no, I mean, infected anymore. yeah, I mean, if you know your house is clean, then you're good to yeah. go. Just, yeah, you yeah. Know, so that's, uh, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Kendall, you hear me, right? The same, yeah, thing. yeah. So, so it's pronounced rich, am I right? Yes, okay. I want, I didn't want the Tony Iommi slap down. No, it's like, uh, oh, yeah, did you see? That? I saw your meme. That was great. Did you <laughs> see that today? Yeah. That, yeah. That's uh, one of the texts. Uh, you know, and I, that was a hoot. That's funny. I quite, well, at first I thought, well, why does he have Tony on there? But now I kind of see you kind of go. <laughs> like a younger version. Okay. <laughs> I get it. All righty. So how did you come to work with Nectar? I was, um, I was in Fire Ballet. Yeah. The band Fire right? Ballet. Yeah. So I, I did two albums with them. And... Uh, both albums were done at the House of Music in New Jersey, two different locations. The first House of Music was a smaller place in someone's basement. Then they moved and they built it um, in Pleasant Valley Road up in uh, wherever, in, in North Jersey. In any case. Uh, West Orange. In West Orange, right. Thank you, Randy. So I'm up there uh, and I just walked away from Fire Ballet, two albums. And the second record was kind of the swan song. So, okay, so I knew everyone at the studio. Um, at the house of music and I was doing some sessions there and hanging out, you know, sleeping on the couch, three o'clock in the morning stuff, learning the board uh, and just, I'll have my own time at that time to do my own demos and stuff. And uh, these guys were in there recording. I think magic is a child, right? right? That's right. that. And we take two ships in the night and uh, 
I forget which one, but someone invited me down to um, the house. These guys were living. I, think I, did. I think Mo did, yes. Um, and they had his house in Chatham, which is a small world because Randy lived a couple of blocks away from that house. Um, in any six case, houses, six houses away. Six houses. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> See, and, crazy, um, crazy stuff. So they, they small called, world, small world. Oh, so yeah. they called me over to to jam and to to hang out and uh, and Larry Fast was there, and then he left and he um, went on tour with uh, Peter Gabriel in those days, and so it was the band, and I was thrilled, and uh, we started playing together and wrote most of the other side, the new album back in 1978. We just really clicked back then. Then Roy came back. Uh, I think in 78, and we did a couple of shows together, one show at Players Tavern, and then Roy's there. So I said, well, Nectar doesn't need me there anymore. So I, I took off and they, they did their thing. Uh, and then Mo called me a couple of decades later and said, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you want to get together and finish these songs? I'm there. Well, I've been waiting for 40 years, Mo. I mean, uh, yes, of course. Uh, and, and that's that story. Well, that, that totally it was magic right away. The magic was there. It, it it felt right right away. Yeah, well, it just seems like there's a great connection already formed there. You know, for so for you to step into Roy's shoes, I mean, who better? You know? Oh yeah, and look, you I I've learned a lot. You know, uh, you know, Roy uh, is a wonderful writer, singer, guitarist, and just by doing that is uh it bumps up me too to to get into that style of things. Before that, I was in Renaissance for a couple of for four tours. Oh wow! And okay, same thing happened with Michael Dunford. Uh, I learned how to, you know, if you listen to some music of uh, my other band, Flying Dreams, back before Nectar, you hear some Michael Dunford licks in there because whoever you're playing with at that time, you carry with you to your next project. Sometimes, you know. Sure. So, and just That's learning those songs that they wrote, you're going to learn some of their, their licks and stuff, you know, oh, yeah. rub off. And the same thing with Roy, the, the same thing with, with early Nectar uh, and stuff. And it, it really, you know, I'm honored to be here. Uh, it's, it's a, it's just a great, great feeling to be here. And uh, it's very homey, but still um, if uh, you have to be on my toes because, you know, uh, there's a couple of dirty looks now and then when I'm clamming out playing uh, a song, especially from the guy with the hat on, not mentioning any names. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah, they keep me on my toes and it's, it's a lot of fun and it's a, uh, it's a wonderful band. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. How about you, Randy? You've been playing with them for a while now on and off. Am I right? Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So it's interesting how you guys have got the two bass thing going. That's uh, kind of unique. Tell me, uh, oh. Kind of how you, interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, tell me how you came to work with the band originally and how that two bass approach works now. Uh, well, that's um, the story of how I got into the band was, like Rich had said, they were rehearsing. They came to the, the States in the 70s and moved to Morris County. Correct me if I'm wrong on the story. This is from the different people that in the band that I've heard the story. So they came to the U.S. to, to crack the US, the U.S. market. They came to Morris County, New Jersey, of all places. And then they had a bunch of different houses. I think, wasn't there one in Mendham or Bernardsville? Is that correct? No? Maybe? Um, yeah, one in Peapack. One in Peapack. And, and the, the, the one house where Mo was, was in Chatham, New Jersey, which was six houses away from where I lived, where I grew up. Ironically enough, they had actually become one of my favorite bands growing up. There was it's the classic story. We're at my buddy's house. He's got an older brother who had a really big record collection. And you'd go, we, you know, you're 15, 16 years old. Let me look at, whoa, look at this cover of Fragile. That is exactly. cool. It's got to be good stuff. And you put it on. You're, you're a yes fan. You're hooked. You're going through. You look. Nectar, what's this? You pull. You remember the future of the you know how that goes back then, you know, that's all there was. There wasn't any internet or uh, the, the cable TV, you know? So if the cover looked cool, the music must be cool. That was the theory. So remember the future and then you're hooked. So, um, so I was a big fan, blah, blah, blah. So, and you'd see them standing on the street. I mean, they, the Chatham is a very, uh, you know, affluent community um, with a lot of guys that live, work in New York 
and here's this rock band and they're standing outside getting this mail and, and Mo, Mo's a big guy. And back then he had these long, long hair and they, I mean, they stood out, you know, but uh, me and my buddies, we were a little, we were 16 year old kids. We were a little apprehensive to approach them. So it was just going to the concert. So uh, anyway, after the original big split up, half the keyboard player lived in an apartment building downtown Chatham where I worked and I would see him around and I would say, you're Taft Freeman from Nectar. And Taff is a very soft-spoken guy and he would say, I am. And so after seeing him a bunch of times, I, you know, get up the courage to ask him a couple of questions about this and that. We became friends. We played together. Um, then the whole near fest thing came to be, sorry, this is so long-winded, but you asked. No, uh, fine. We got that. <laughs> it, the near fest thing happened. They reunited. It was great. I was there. I went to that concert. I'm sure you know about yeah, that. I, I saw it. Loved it. Right, right. Um, and they did a little bit of a tour and I would see Taff again. Again, you know, at the end of the day, Taff went home. I went home and did see him at the, at the place, the chit chat. And, um, and then, then the word was, and that, that's when the internet really started to pick up and there was a, there was a Nectar chat group. Uh, that was, that was Sandy, that was Wayne's, I think. Right, Mo? Wasn't yeah, that? Um, Wayne's site, yeah. Right, so. The Nectarproject.com. Yeah, Right, so it was like a, this forum group that they would have. So, uh, so it, it was announced that the Mo decided he didn't want to carry on. They did a couple of dates over in Europe. They did a couple more dates in the U.S. After that, he didn't want to do anything. Else. So that a new replacement had had been found for for Mo, and right away I got on the horn with Tap and I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" Because I was a bass player and I spent my you know, my youth practicing all the riffs, playing all the songs. That was my thing. So I said to Tap, I said, look, let me at least have an audition. So he said, begrudgingly said, okay, sure, come over. So I went down and I played. I guess he was impressed with it. We played a couple of times. Then he called Ron down. Um, and I was a little worried about Ron because um, I didn't think Ron liked me at first, to be honest. Because um, I think it was, I think it was John was the original replacement, wasn't he? Ron? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. John Perlin, who's, yes, who's the house we rehearse in now. Um, very nice fellow in front of the band forever. So um, anyway, so I then. I didn't know that. I didn't know that was John. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. and I didn't know that till later either, actually. But um, so they liked what I did. And then the, the, the manager at the time, um, who actually is now owns the record company, uh, rang, rang me up. Uh, the record company, Cherry Red, that we have the other side on. He was, at the time, he was sort of managing us a little bit and, and helping us put uh, the new record, which then was actually Evolution. And he said, look, if you want to do this, here's the commitment. You got to do a U.S. tour, a European tour, and do a new record. And I said, uh, okay. <laughs> How do you say no to that? Sure. Um, Twist my arm, please. Oh. Right, exactly, exactly right. So, you know, Roy Roy was <laughs> our, mine and my buddies, uh, uh, and one of those buddies that I speak of, guys, is Tom. Tom is our guitar tech who's been on the road with us recently, um, uh, and another guy, Bill. But anyway, so, you know, Roy, Roy, these guys were our heroes, so how do you say no to that, you know? Um, it's That's how we got in the band. Ugh. Long story. So, <laughs> there's that. So then... Then I decided to leave. I had a growing business at the time after a couple of years of it. Um, i just gotten married. So th there was all these other things that were going on. And so I said, look, it's, it's time for me to, to step back. So I stepped back. Um, they carried on for a while. Roy passed. Um, there was a, obviously, how do you do that? You know, Ron decided he really wanted to carry on with this and keep this going. He says, talk, talk, talk to Mo. Mo, Mo liked the way that I played bass, and he said, "Look, you're a good part of the band. You're you're, you're a good influence on everything. Why not come in, and let's see if we'll, we can do." Um, and I said, "Okay." So we, I got to tell you, as musicians go, most musicians, whatever instrument they play, they want to play. They want to be the guy. Eh, you know, I'm the bass player. I'm going to play the bass parts. Eh, I'm the keyboard player. I play. You know, the drummer. Eh, you know, you get think a couple of bands that have two drummers, but. Uh, but my point though, was that Mo's one of the most generous musicians that I've ever played with. He's like, look, this is the bass part, but you, you know, basically he goes high, I go low. I go low, he goes high. 
and we sort of work together to create one one sound. And and most bass players would not do that, I don't think, because no. that's really the odd. I mean, you see two keyboard players, you see two drummers, obviously two guitarists, um, but very very few double bass players at the same time. And he plays an eight string bass on Recycled, which was done with the original recording and i play bass along with that so it's if you don't like bass it's the wrong show to go to. <laughs> so it's a, that, that's a powerful sound by the way yeah i've always wanted to play that. with two basses yeah yeah that's a short list of groups that have two bass players that's a that's a rarity yeah it really really is you guys play things like an octave sometimes or exactly right exactly. yeah okay well that's a big fat sound then Oh yeah. No. yeah. Well, Randy, would you uh, would you like to tell him about your initiation? Seen as Kendall got one. Uh huh. My what was my initiation? I forget. That was recording evolution, doing that riff. Oh, you really you're really gonna bring that up? <laughs> oh. That was so uh, funny. That was so oh, funny. Yeah, yeah. There was there was the the, the producer uh, uh, Julian Hastings, uh, the producer of Evolution. We were recording at a, at a studio in um, in in England. And there was this one section that, that, that was, I was having a hard time catching. It was a little tricky. And, um, and the, the producer, this guy, he was quite a character, uh, sort of looked at me, stood up, and just took a bunch of pocket change and just sort of, you know, drop in the money as if you know, the metaphor, <laughs> right. you know, time is money, pal. <laughs> you know, he just kept. So the band got a huge <laughs> kick out of that. And to this day, he still remembers it. Oh, it's fun. Well, it's I forgot fun. about that. Yeah, that was funny at the time. So, uh, if, uh, anyway, that was, I know it was long-winded, uh, but that that's the story. So that's kind of how it came to be. So the, the other thing is that I'm st- I've been playing 12-string guitar because at some places, it's too much to have two basses. Sure. It's just too much. So um, uh, I've always been a big fan of Genesis and the two 12-string guitars. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, I played a little bit guitar. So I, uh, I've done a lot of wood shedding and uh, hopefully gotten up to snuff. And Rich has been also very generous in being, you know, you know, here, play this. This works with me and that works with him. That and, sounds great together. Uh, yeah. It just sounds Yeah, great. it's a nice, it's, it's a nice combo. So. Very cool. So so, uh, he also plays the bass pedals, which gives his unbelievable mm-hmm. bottom end. Uh, yeah, don't right. encourage him too much for no, that. I, I love those. I like to have my feelings shook, you know? Yeah, that's it, baby. <laughs> or the whole it. building yeah, just yeah, shook, you know? It's a glorious <laughs> moment, you know? Exactly. Absolutely. So, Ken was my partner in crime on that. He likes the low end as well as I yeah. do. So. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I wanted to go around the room real quick. I have this part of the show where I ask everybody what the first record was that they bought. I was wondering if any of you guys remember. Uh, how about you, Mick? Shadows? One of the early Shadows? No, wait a minute. That would have been Brenda Lee. Brenda Lee, okay. Coming Brenda on strong? Okay. Yeah, Little Miss Dynamite. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, she's something else in her. Uh, rock- I was about 14. <laughs> Rocking around the Christmas tree will be playing yeah, before well, we know yeah. it. You know? It's, a, it's a great tune with the little 13th chord in there. Zippy zip. It's fun right. stuff. <laughs> how about you, Randy? First the record. record that I bought or that I received? Yeah, just bought, I guess. I don't know. Whichever one comes to mind more. Oh, jeez. No. I, uh, uh, I'm going to drop that change now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, well, I, I think I want to uh, say um, it, it could have been recycled, believe it or not. Good been, answer. It, that I bought. I mean, my parents gave me a lot of stuff when I was a kid, but that's actually. I'm not 100 percent positive, but I th- I think it was that for the for the sake of the the nectarines and the nectar community here. I would say I think it's re- it was recycled. All right. How well, about you, Ron? Um, well, when I was a kid, my brother used to make me go down to the record store and buy one of the hit records for his girlfriend. Uh, and make believe that he'd gone down to the record store and bought it. I mean, in fact, it was me. So actually, the first one that I bought for myself, I think it was uh, Cliff Richard, Move It. Okay, good, good, yeah. That was like a really great song. I still yeah. got one. Still okay. got it. Yeah. How about you, Kendall? Actually bought 
I th it was a Yes album. Uh, and I can't remember which one, but I just, I remember it was either that or a Zeppelin album. It was one of the two for sure actually purchased. There were singles. I bought 45s as a kid. I think those were the first ones, but I can't really remember. You know, those are all gone, giving away my age. But yeah, I have, it, it was a Yes album for sure, okay. I think. Yeah. Good choice. Okay. Um, Started yeah. early. Yeah. Big age difference here. Whoa. How about you, Rich? <laughs> hey, Rich, how about yours? Um, the one I actually I bought myself uh, was the Israeli Gears. Cream. Oh. oh, that's very cool. I'm actually going to have uh, Ginger Baker's son on my show wow. in a few weeks to chat about cream. So, oh, that'd be cool. Stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. I figured. You know, my, uh, my 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 doctor is uh, my local doctor here. Is uh, was produced uh, um, produced his record one of his records, Kofi, really? right? That's wild. It's Kofi yeah. Baker, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so, right? Small small world. Yeah. Because we talk about it all the time when I go visit him. It was it Ginger Baker's Air Force? You remember that band? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, Mo, how about him. you? I love him. Oh, I'm sorry. What was your first record uh, you remember buying? Me. Um, well, actually, I have to uh, concur with Ron because the first one I bought was Move It as well. Um, back in the back in those days, where there was a switch over from uh, crooning like uh, Everly Brothers and whatnot to rock and roll, uh, Bill Haley. I remember when Bill Haley came out with the uh, uh, Comets, and then out of England was. Uh, Cliff Richards and the Shadows and the Shadows were a great band. I mean, they were really, really great band for their time. They took the music into an, onto another level. If you like, Cliff Richards was probably the Elvis Presley of England. Sure, something like yeah. that, right, Ron? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the the first first forty five that I bought was Move It because my sister was really into. It. In fact, she still goes to his concerts. My sister. <laughs> they uh, they sold a lot of red Stratocasters in the process. Oh yeah, yeah. Man, like everybody wanted. Do, you, one do you know that they offered Hank Marvin a job with Yes? That would have been different. Would have been very different. Yeah. And he just laughed it off. <laughs> yeah. He's quite a character, from what I understand. Yeah. I'll let, you know what? I have to change my 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 record that was not the first okay i had a little time to think about it, it was actually machine head by deep purple oh, deep nice. purple yeah That's i saw i one. saw a cover but you know classic smoke on the water you know uh, i'll tell you my deep purple story yeah when i was when richie blackmore was 15 he used to play with a band called screaming lord such and the savages yeah and yeah. i used to go down to the empress ballrooms in uh Mexborough to watch him. Uh, he, he was unbelievable. Always had a great band. Always had a great band. And uh, I remember seeing uh, R Richie Blackmore. He was 15 playing with it, playing with that band. And wow. killing it even at 15, I bet. Oh, it was hot, man. He was a great guitar. He's a great guitar. Yeah, he really yeah. is. And I think he kind of gets lost in the shuffle sometimes. Yeah. You know, people always talk about Clapton, Page, and Beck, but Blackmore is right up there as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. yeah. He, yeah. he used to play uh, Fly to the Bumblebee. Ah. Give you an idea how, how fast his fingers were. I really like his project that he has now, The Medieval, with his wife. Yeah. Oh, Blackmore's but, Night, right? Yeah. Oh, Blackmore. what a singer his wife is. Oh, yeah. she's, she's beautiful too. Yeah, um, yeah. They have a Christmas um, EP they just finished, mm -hmm. actually. So, uh, look that up if y'all are interested in their their medieval stuff. Uh, it's a medieval Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course it is. Green one. So tell me a bit more about the new album, uh, the other side. Um, where's the best place to get that? The same spot on your website nectarsmusic.com nectarsmusic.com nectarsmusic yeah with an s yeah nectarsmusic.com is the place to get it but you can also buy it uh i think can you buy it on amazon um it's a, an import as an import from what mark pal has right 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 but um 
we, we, we can't, we don't have, they won't allow us to be on Amazon right now. Yeah. In the, in yeah the we US. have problems with that other band in Germany, you know? Right. But we have, we have the CD, we have the, the double vinyl album uh, as well. And we also have a, uh, a hand signed by everybody in the band. We have a handful of those before we uh, left or broke up. So that, that's, um, and you can listen to snippets on our website as well, too. And when did this one come out? Was it last summer? Or January. Okay. January 24th, I believe, of last year. Yeah. Okay, so this new one's available, July. been available. Yeah. The live one now, is that available or is that coming soon? Just a download version. The download version is available now. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And it's, it, it's a full concert. It's about two and a half hours. It's got video and audio, and it's just like, just as if you're there. It's really, really good. It's a good concert. Excellent. Well, I think that they'd be great for any Nectar fan for Christmas. So uh, Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Get over there and check it out, folks. Definitely. Please. Awesome. Uh, where did you record the, the most recent album at, the studio one? Shawfire. Yeah, Shawfire, Shawfire. Studios in... Uh, Long Branch. Long Branch. Okay. And I got to tell you, it's a fabulous place. It really is. We, yes. we, we just locked in. And Mo has got a very unique way of uh, assessing a recording studio's ambiance. Why don't you tell him that story, Mo? He, he did it in a couple of different places before we decided on that, that place. Clapping? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I like to go into the studio and clap, and you see, you can tell by the how the the reverb is, how how the slap echo is, if it's going to be a good sound. And that place was awesome, absolutely awesome from day one. Um, Great engineer think, Joe DeMeo. Yeah, Joe DeMeo. Oh. Joe DeMeo's magic. Yeah, I mean he really is. He 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 has a uh, the studio console's very analog. It's an old Helios board, historic board. Yeah. Tell them about the board. That board is really historic. I think that board came from uh, uh, England. Oh, not Abbey Road. The, one of the uh, oh, what the hell? Is it it? Olympic yeah. Studios. I think it came from. Well, the yeah. title you would know, right? I think it was Olympic. But Olympic it's, Studios. There's only yeah. a few left. It's a wonderful room. But, wonderful, wonderful board. But Sean, you know the whole. The whole gated reverb drum trick Gabriel and Collins came up with right. the accident. Okay. Well, that album and that sound was from that board. He, oh wow. That actual board. I got I chills it, when I, I heard that. I think it was one of Richard Branson's studio. Yeah. One of his two studios. Okay. So and he, he brought he brought that board over. Yeah. Well, and he had the piano from the House of Music. Old analog gear all over the place. Yeah. Old B threes, old Leslie's beefed up, old Marshalls. I walked in. Uh, you see a bunch of Echoplexes back in the day for guitar players that you know you could actually, you know, just old school stuff that uh, we fell in love with. Just really great. I don't know how many drum sets he got, but he'll got a lot of them. <laughs> I know, uh, right, Ron? Yeah. You yeah, that, that was the that was the deal about the studio. We felt so comfortable. And that's why the tracks came out so good because we were, we were so comfortable playing them. And it makes a big difference. You didn't have to think about anything. It was just a great sound, a great feeling. And the it came across on the, the, uh, on the recording. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Joe we, said that he never had a drummer that had such um, control over his, his bass drum, the, the same the same power on every hit. You see, I'd never seen that before. I mean, I'm used to it. I've been playing with him for God knows how long. And we're hearing that now. Uh, yeah. You know, so yeah, we're hearing that here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Ronnie, I'm telling you, you know, uh, pr pretty good stuff, man. Yeah. So. Yeah. One thing. I, one thing I will say about Ronnie is he never plays the same thing twice. Every time you hear a, a, a song, he's playing it in a different way, but he's still got the same drive. Um, definitely very special. Mostly because at my age, I forget what I played anyway, so I just go for it. <laughs> Let's make it up. 
Oh, so I didn't tell you what my first record I bought was. Oh, what was it? Fly Like an Eagle from Steve. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I was eight, you know. There you go. I, band, rather, I, remember seeing, I remember seeing Yes and all that stuff, though. I spent most of my time in the record section when my mom was shopping, you know, a whole set right, right. collection. But for some reason, yeah, I was kind of into Steve Miller at the time. I branched out a bit since then. <laughs> Just we did while. we did a cover of the Fly Like an Eagle on the um, Spoonful of Time CD. Oh wow! Okay. I don't know if you ever heard that CD. Um, I don't think it was, I have. Uh, a whole CD that we put together from Cleopatra, and it were it had a lot of um, uh, name musicians, you know, like people from Yes, Moody Blues, um, all different kinds of people playing on it, and we did a lot of um, covers like Yes. And uh, we did that with Billy Sherwood. And the oh, yeah. singer of Toto happened to be hanging out with him. So he came in and sang it. Oh, yeah, so Bobby it Kimball. Great. So uh, actually, it sounds just like Toto, basically. You know, because he's singing it. He's doing the exact same vocal. So, uh, yeah, anyway, you just reminded me of that when you said uh, about Steve Miller. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I always thought that had a cool riff. I still do. And I like check, the synthesis. Check out that CD. It's that good. It's got slow. some good people on it. Yeah, yeah. We'll definitely yeah. look that one up. Yeah. All righty. Um, so now I want to talk a bit about uh about your current gear. Um, Randy, what are you, where are you, you playing lately? What's your... None of uh, your business. Oh, uh, yeah? <laughs> the Hondo. All right, I get it. <laughs> a Hondo. Yeah. Okay. No wonder you don't want to talk about it. I think my first bass was a Hondo. God, that's funny you say that. <laughs> uh, play the Rickenbacker 401. Uh, I think it's 72. My nice old one. Um, uh, uh, the Angelico 12 string. Um, and a Moog Taurus bass pedals. Okay. Um, and and a Helix effects pedal board and a couple of Wah Wahs and volume pedals. Oh, yeah. I've heard great stuff about the Helix. A lot of people really oh, swear by great. them. Great, great effects unit. Yeah. Did you say that line sex has come a long way in the last ten years? Yes, in the last. <clears throat> I thought they were really cheesy in the beginning. Uh, remember, it was like that little pod. Yeah, the kid shape the, thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, "Well, there's no buttons on it. How do you ch change it?" And um, so um, I've had a couple of various ones. I had a bass pod, which was. My one critique of all these things is that they're, you know, the old fashioned ones, the old MXR, you know, flangers and phase shifters and the echo boxes, you know, with three knobs, you could get, all, and some of the best records were made with those things, three knobs, and you get the great sound. Now, you've got infinite possibilities of infinite chorus effects and, and the time signatures, and it's on, it's, it's a bit to me, it's a little too much, but that'd be my only critique. But this one is, uh, uh, the one that I had before had all kinds of, not only the different effects, but it had amplifier models and speaker models and microphone models and the distance you could put between the mic and the speaker. And I, it was just way too much for, my, for me anyway. Yeah, it's almost uh, like too many options. It's like, you know, just very Italian, you know? You know. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's go. Anyway. Okay. And, and Ron, how about uh, what kit are you favoring at the moment? At uh, the moment, I'm playing an Ellis kit, Ellis Drums. He's out of Minneapolis, but um, his company is uh, he's trying to rebuild it, so it's in limbo right now. Uh, but that's what I'm playing right now. Okay. And uh, cymbals, uh, a mixture of Sabian and uh, Pasty. Okay. Very cool. And Kindle, I can see a lot of what you have there. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, traveling, <laughs> traveling <laughs> is another story. So traveling, I use a, a Korg Kronos and on top a, a Nord stage, yeah. and that connects to main stage um, to get some extra sounds. And it's yeah. easy to move around. And Kronos is the versatile. Bomb. Oh, it's great. Everybody, you see it on the boat. Everybody's got one. You know, it's one of the more powerful uh, workstations. Um, but as we go forward with the live stream stuff, where we're, I think, going to be setting up in one spot, not worrying about going city to city, I'll probably bring some more stuff to have some fun with. Bring the Moog with you there, you think? Possibly, or some other things that you can't see, but yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> get some, <laughs> get yeah, a white M&B palette. Three in the other room. <laughs> the other room can't see the other side. But uh, yeah, I unfortunately grew up in the age of uh, Keith Emerson and Eddie Jobson and, you know, Wakeman, where more is better in some ways. You know, it's a lot of fun. But uh, then I got to work for Eddie Jobson for a little bit. And he pared everything down to a few laptops and two keyboards. And that's where I got to see that, well, I guess you don't have to do that, but it's fun anyway. Right. I mean, it's all through MIDI that he switches all those sounds and stuff, right? Yeah. But he's, he's a master, Oh yeah, master programmer, master. He just got that wired yeah, dial. I, I had the pleasure of seeing him at Nearfest a couple of years in a row with a reassembled UK and oh, at Nearfest, yeah. Yeah, and the prior year he had like a super group with like Billy Sheehan and Mark Benia and really oh, great, yeah, yeah. very able crew and two yeah. drummers. They had Marco Miniman and Mike Mangini. Mangini. Yeah. As if one wasn't plenty. Enough. It's Get like two that, master drummers. The 20-minute drum solo was mind-melting. And you know what I have to mention because I went by <laughs> that playing with Ron and Mo for the first time um i'd play with richie we write and play together very easily uh four years five years before oh yeah you know we it it's very easy but uh when i came down and played with mo and ron there's a difference between playing with people that play cover music of the day and then there's the originals (laughs) so playing with the rhythm section is very signature and these guys the rock it's 1969 it's like this feel you can't you can't imitate it it's the real real thing so it's we're one big rock. family but it, it we all fit together mick and randy too and marianne you know but that feel that rhythm section feel is really really special yeah ron and i have clicked from day one from in 1964 it, it just clicked I know what he's thinking. He knows what I'm thinking. We're not at each other and we know exactly where we are. It's always been that way. Yeah, we changed drummers in one night and that was it. <laughs> yeah, right. He came, he walked up on stage to us. Uh, I was playing with a band called Judd's Mates and he walked up and he said, I want to play with you guys. <laughs> So we, we switched drummers. We gave them our drum and we took wrong. <laughs> it was never great. heard that story. Yeah. That's great. But Ken, so, Kendall brings up a, a good point. There's, there's, you know, I played in a, in a bunch of bands and you know, cover bands and, you know, Rich has too. And, and Ron has as well. I mean, you, you know, you, you've got to pay bills and that's how you sort of cut your chops. But, um, when when you know the, these guys were like like Bruford and, and Squire and and Rutherford and Collins, I mean they they were like like the the real deal. Remember the future, the down to earth recycle. I mean those albums. The, these are sometimes you just, I got to pinch myself and say, wait a minute, I'm playing with these guys. Well, it's <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that that the is- real fucking guys it's you know it's not you know it's not joe down blow down the road who copied what he was doing you listen to, like the subtleties to remember the future and recycle the drums as a bass player learning it growing up you'd listen to that because you're playing together but those tiny little subtleties that are there he plays it's there they're little kick drums you can barely tell that they're there he's playing them so it's like Kendall said, it's the it's the it's the real deal. You know, you learn the song by the record. If you're doing that with your regular cover band and you go in, it's not really exactly the same. You know what I mean? So it, there's a lot to be said for that. Oh, absolutely. And um, I mean, just getting a chance to play alongside someone that influenced you from such a young age, that must be a dream come true. Oh, it's, you know, it's amazing. It reminds me a bit of the Billy Sherwood, Chris Squire dynamic, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Absolutely. Very similar to that. Similar kind of thing. And, you know, there was even a moment on their 94 tour where they both played bass together. Like, yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Follow them on the different social stuff. Like a five minute thing, but it's like, uh, you know, that's kind of neat how he, you know, who better to take Chris's place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Billy. 
groomed for great, success. Great <laughs> yeah. um, so, Rich, what do you? What's your rig lately? What have you been playing? I play my endorsements. You know, whatever okay. I get for nothing, I play. You know. <laughs> oh yeah. Who's giving you stuff? You know? Mister uh, Honest. Well, at least he's honest, right? <laughs> So, uh, no, uh, well, uh, our lawyer, Ron Beanstalk, got me a, a mid-level 335 uh, Schechter Corsair, uh, which I, I play. Um, switched out the pickups because those mid-level guitars going to switch out pickups and stuff. Sure. Get some PAFs in it, some, some DiMarzios, and I use it. It's great. I use a, an old Parker MIDI Fly mm -hmm. uh, guitar. Um, and... For the first time in a long time, I'm pedal based. I'm also a Helix okay. and HX effects, actually, that, which Kendall actually turned us all on to. We all bought Helixes in this band. Um, and a Quilter Amp, which is uh, just a clean amplifier and some Mesa Boogie 12s. Great band. Uh, and Great it's like, like that, between a Quilter being clean and uh, the Helix um, and... Some other things I use a pog too to get some octave effects and stuff, but just like that between the Schecter, the Parker, and the uh, the Helix, that's the sound that I'm using. Yeah, Very cool. Now, does Helix is just just for guitar, or does it work well for bass as well? Works well for bass. Works well for bass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. It, it's um. And it's not like a different version for the bass. It's the no. same one that you'd no. use for your guitar. No. Correct, correct, yeah. yeah it's, it's the same one, you know, and I even play a Wawa, you know, I'm a crybaby fanatic, but uh, just for time's sake and just to keep the pedal board a little cleaner, uh, you play the Helix, you, you play the, uh, the Mission pedal on it, and it, uh, you have to get used to it because it's, it's, you, backwards. it's kind of backwards, <laughs> but it sounds great, and once you dig into it, it's a, it's a great, clean set up and w when you're touring as much as we do it's good to keep it clean and just quick simple yeah. sure one less cable right yeah oh yeah. and why we all have wireless of course you know so we you know we're pretty quick and clean yeah now do you like have a different setting for like each song where you have a different tier and you just kind of go down the list as the song i do list I, I, do. I, I do yeah they, they have like snapshots that you just uh click on and uh and different things different effects different echoes for every song how long did it take you to set that thing up with all your custom sounds? How Kendall, Kendall helped me uh, with, with that because he, um, he's the master of... Uh, the of hardest all. part of all this is setting it up to make yeah, it go. It so, right. and, yeah. and I have a handle on it now, but well, what, a couple of weeks, I guess, of just uh, yeah. messing around with it. Um, and again, I keep it pretty simple. I keep it pretty simple. I, I don't use the different, too many different echoes and, and really time them out. I keep it like it's an old, if, if it was, if I was to snap my fingers and I would go from a digital world into the old analog world, it, it would be like a, like a Vox or a, a Cryberry Baby Wawa. It would be like a, uh, an old Brown Marshall and, uh, and that's about it in an Echoplex. So that, that's the kind of sound I like to get. Uh, and on every song, that's, it goes there. Now, are you aiming to try and kind of nail the tones that Roy had on those records? Just well, that's why that's why uh, with the Parker didn't quite have that that uh, that bigger box yeah, sound. That's, that's why I got a three thirty five, you know. And uh, uh, I have another three thirty five, but I thought it was kind of a cool idea to get the the, the Schecter. It it looks like a three thirty five. The neck is great, and um, it has a certain Roy had a, a like a woodiness to his uh, sound, like uh, it, it was a 335 sound and it was clean and distorted, but it had that mid to it. So uh, I picked one up okay. uh, and uh, it works. Now, didn't Roy play one that was kind of different than your average 335? It was an Epiphone Sheraton. Okay. Did it have an extra string or was it just six strings? He, he actually put two other strings on it to try it. He thought it would be a good idea at the time to have like that 12 string feel. Uh -huh. But I don't think he'd thought it through that you need to bend the strings once in a while. Mm -hmm. right. And having two strings doesn't work very well. No. So he, he, he drilled the holes. He put the, the uh, keys in, strung it. And it, it was a unique sound, but he couldn't play it. So he stopped. He, he okay. left the pegs on because he didn't want to ruin his guitar and took the strings off and went back to the sixth string. Oh, That's okay. basically the story behind that. 
Okay. I always wonder what the deal was with that. I didn't realize it was something that just didn't really work. I thought maybe it did. Okay. Yeah. That's wild. Very cool. It, it, those Sheratons back in those days, uh, Epiphone was a different guitar than now. Now oh, yeah. they're mm -hmm. kind of like uh, just a mass produced thing. But in those days, those things really were great. Well, oh yeah, and they were their own thing. It wasn't Gibson, like Gibson, Gibson, yeah. right? Gibson made them back then. Yeah, well, then they went to went to China. I think. I think they. Uh, I don't know if they came back. I have a. Uh, I've got a, a Gibson EB2, and I've got the matching one uh, Epiphone uh, Sheraton. Um, I don't bring them out to play, but I I have them. Um, I I have. Uh, um, I have my old Rick, the Rick from early 70s, so stereo. I never used the stereo. I've always used it uh, straight. Uh, I put a mixer on it so I can mix some Fender pickups in there to give it uh, an extra kick. Do you have the toaster thing on it, or did you take that off? A what? You know that kind of metal cover that goes over the oh, pickups? I, I, I threw that away the first day. Yeah, I was going to say. Oh, it's yeah. just first frustrating. Day, I just can't deal with it. Too much stuff. I took, yeah, the, I took the plate off. Done. I took the plate off and tossed it, and I took the uh, cover off and tossed it. And I've never used it. Uh, I use. Uh, I bumped into uh, Jimmy Howe uh, from Rotter Sound uh, when he was at the uh, uh, festival in Germany in, in Frankfurt, and he uh, we were talking about strings and sounds and stuff like that. And he said, uh, I've come out with a new string. And he, he brought it out and he took, got like a piece on it that you use the Allen wrench for. And there's a thin piece goes over the bridge, the, the same on every string, so that the string will resonate the same on every string. And uh, it gave me a suitcase full of them. And I've used, I've used that type of string ever since. I, I use them today. The, they're called the piano bass strings today, um, but they still have a little ball you've got to put on to, to get it just right yeah. for your guitar. But I'm going to tell you, them string you can you can you can't wear them out. That bass sound is incredible. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can't. They always sound new. They never sound old. Were you using flats back in in the early days before this? Yes, this I used on? to use flats on my Gibson EB2, and then I switched from the flats to the uh, uh, um, brown wound because yeah. it, it just give it a different feel. Um, I also use a, an old Fender uh, jazz bass um, that I use the piano bass strings on and I change them pickups. What the pickups did I put on them? Oh, they were uh, I th the Marcio replacement pickups, yeah. uh, jazz pickups. They, they kick out. No, there was something special about those pickups. That huh? There was something special about those pickups. When you came back with that thing, it's like a whole new base. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, I agree. They're like, I agree. like some, some, something vintage, wasn't it? They were like original vintage. vintage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I, they I, were I, just killer. But I, I told him, I said, I, whatever you feel should be on this, put them on it. And he did. And yeah. it, boy, it was awesome sound. That, that was Kyle from uh, Guitar Repair and Freehold, who, yeah, who yeah. does all our guitars and he's, stuff. He's that, very good. Very cool. And then the third guitar I've got I use on stage is a John Birch. It's a double neck, eight string, four string. Oh, wow. um, it's the only one he ever made. Uh, all the all the bands around the area, the uh, um, Tony Alomi and and uh, and all these guys that were around that, the Birmingham area, uh, they all wanted to buy it. They wouldn't sell it because it made it for me. Uh, but that sucker man, that just plays it. Plays and plays. When you when you put that together with a regular bass, like uh, uh, Randy plays and Rick, and boy, it's a powerful sound. Powerful sound. I can imagine. Yeah. I, I use a uh, a Galleon Kruger amp, eight hundred watt, and a Shure uh, setup for the uh, wireless, and then I, I use a Galleon Kruger four tens, and th that sits on a box. But it's dampened so that it doesn't uh, vi doesn't vibrate. Uh, but I like I like a very trebly sound because the trebly sound will give you a a, a punchy bass sound out front. So I I use a, a very trebly sound. 
on my uh, guitars. How do you feel about the jazz versus the P bass? You prefer the jazz or? Oh yeah. 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 The jazz is, it's got a great, it's got a slimmer neck. Yeah. The, the precision bass is too fat. I have big hands, but it's too fat in your hands. I've um, heard that people say that before. Yeah. That it's the yeah. next kind of but the jazz really plays well, but I'm going to tell you, there is not a, not a bass guitar that I have seen that plays like the Rickenbacker. The Rickenbacker is it's like putting on a pair of old shoes. Mm -hmm. you, you put it on and you play. And I, whether I play mine or I did some stuff with Randy's, great sound, great sound. Always, it's easy to play. So you can play fast, you can play uh, octaves, no problem. Everything's, uh, I, I really like the Rickenbacker. It's my really favorite guitar. Neck, yeah. How about you, Randy? P bass oh, or jazz? Um, well, I like them both for different applications, different reasons. But but I, you know, the jazz bass originally was meant to be an electric stand-up bass. Yeah, so yeah. the older ones, the neck really tapers down at the end. I had one that I bought out in San Francisco when I was a kid, and um, it was sixteen years old. And I, and I had reluctantly had to sell it. Um, who hasn't had that story? Um, and man, do I regret it. But it, and I had a jazz bass recently that I sold um, just because I just didn't need another bass, um, which is probably blasphemy to a lot of people. <laughs> I see you got a handful behind you as well, Sean. Um, yeah. <laughs> not bass, but guitar. But anyway, but uh, push up to shove jazz bass because I like I like to slap. <laughs> so you know that was originated, I think, on a jazz bass too. The, uh, uh, Larry Graham and uh, Brothers Johnson and that whole thing, you know. Stop. So, yeah, yeah. So, gun to my head, jazz versus a precision. Sure. Okay. That would be my pick, too. I play a little jazz. I play, play bass occasionally. I'm actually plays bass in an ELO tribute band at the moment. Oh, my gosh. Wow, cool. Yeah. That's probably the funnest gig in that band, too. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I bet. You know, otherwise, you just strum a lot and play a solo about once every five songs. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, fun stuff. That's cool. So, Mick, I wanted to ask you a bit about your light show and how it evolved. And I'm curious if modern technology has come into play for you. I, I can't imagine you sitting there with a laptop, but maybe. I don't know. Tell me. Uh, don't have to imagine it anymore. You can actually see it being done. Okay. Uh, what happened was the original liquids that I used, uh, originally I had seven... 1,000 watt out as projectors. And I was doing the roundhouse. Uh, that was my gig every Saturday night for about three months. And in between, I did a festival over in, uh, in Holland. And that got the name Fantasia Light Circus known. And all of a sudden, people wanted to book me and, or book the light show rather. Uh, into clubs, and that's what we started doing. Uh, now, uh, as time went by, uh, obviously light shows came into uh, a, a rough area after the flashpot fires and other things that had gone on with effects, and it, they started to deem a they were dangerous because they worked by heat. They could catch fire. I've had a fire up there a few times, but uh, <laughs> it's no big deal. My arm used to catch fire. Jeez. And uh, That's what every venue wants to hear. Yeah. <laughs> used uh, to. Used, to. I, used I, to. I was taking up space in the audience. It was fine when we were in a bigger place. It would be like I'd be in the, in the orchestra pit, but uh, intermediate theaters and clubs, boom, there I was in the middle of the audience, you know. So I was taking bums off seats, which meant money for the promoter, so they didn't like that. The whole thing fell apart when we decided to try rear projection, and I couldn't see what anybody was doing because uh, I take my cues from everybody on stage. I'm playing with them the same as any other musician would. So I'm watching Ron for his cues. I'm watching Roy and Mo for their cues and Taff, you know. And, uh, but it, it worked. And it worked like that for, the, you know, the first six albums. 
the light show just got bigger and bigger and bigger until Roy left and then it started to collapse. It wasn't quite the same. So uh, I retired for like 24 years and we came back at Nearfest mm -hmm. uh, to regroup. So I pulled all the gear out of the attic 24 years later and uh, revived it, uh, improved it, and uh, actually had video back in uh, 2002. Uh, but that, again, that dissolved. Roy went off on his own with the quartet with Ron and another drummer at the time, uh, Prater, and uh, strike two. <laughs> We didn't, the momentum didn't work after Nearfest. Uh, it, somebody dropped the ball somewhere and we disappeared again. So, all right. So Roy ended up touring around Germany and the band broke up. So I came back together with when Mo said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And Ron wanted, you know, do the light show as well. I said, why not? That's what Nectar was. So I pulled it out again. By now, I only had three projectors working out of the seven. These things are 55 years old, you know. So I was going to put LED lamps in them. That doesn't do the heat. It doesn't work like that. So what I did is I had Jay, my new right-hand man now, uh, he filmed me doing a light show, and then we filmed each of the projectors separately. And from that compilation, I managed to be able to play them uh, on a laptop. Okay. So they don't get hot. They're not there. Right. But on top of that, I, we can use the, the old videos, which used to be 16 millimeter film. That was transferred to video. That's superimposed on what I am doing. And uh, I actually found an electronic version of the liquids that I like to play which I think you've seen, and uh, basically uh, it's purple fingers. Savers, but I got about 80 of them. No, you had no more purple fingers. Tell them purple, well, fingers. purple fingers. I have clean hands, look. <laughs> now, how, how did that work in the early days? I mean, it seems like ink's being dripped on a hot light bulb and it's just bubbling, but I can't imagine. I think that'd be really messy. How did you go about doing that? It was messy. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Life is messy. Uh, was it directly yeah, I, on the bulb or was it more like a hot plate that was above the bulb that you just kind of put it uh, on? It depends which light shows you watch. Uh, the uh, Josh White, the Joshua light show, the original, uh, used overhead projectors, epidioscopes, which is a horizontal flat plate of glass, uh, two watch glasses, clock faces, uh, with liquids in between, usually food coloring, could be colored oils. Uh, and you manipulate the glasses with two hands, and that is then projected onto the screen. So you could like well, take it and kind of shake and tilt it as it's going. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's fine, but it gets boring after a while. You need two hands to do it. Sure. Uh, I had slide projectors, which use a little tiny little two by two slide. And I drop ink on one. Put a piece of glass on it, ink on a gala, put the glass on it, put in the slide projector, slide it in, it gets hot. It starts bubbling from the middle. The right temperature comes from the right amount of uh, uh, heat resistant glass that's behind the lens. So I took it out <laughs> okay. and just put regular glass in there instead of uh, lead glass, which is what the projectors originally had. And uh, that was fine for, you know, for the first gig, mm. Prog Stop, which was last, is this still, yes, 29 years, last year still. <laughs> um, and I'd resurrected the old light show just for that, but I had the video back up just in case, because for the last seven years before Prog Stop, I was doing video projections at the... Uh, uh, three-day festivals from Jibber Jazz in Pennsylvania. They're outdoor gigs, 30 bands. I didn't know who was playing. And we did a light show on the main stage and a rave inside 
overnight. Nice. And uh, I started playing around with video projectors and found that I could do stuff with those that I was doing with the liquids. So when we came to do the tour, New Year's Day 2020, January the 1st, I scrapped the liquids. Okay. I literally laid them to rest. That's it. They're done. I had enough, almost enough. I did still record a little bit more that I needed, but I adapted everything, got, uh, in the end, six video projectors, 3,500 lumens, uh, bright enough to show, and I was playing the six between three projectors, uh, between three uh, laptops, a fourth when Jay joined with his, and he takes care of the backdrops and I take care of the overlays. Okay. And uh, together we make good music visually. Yeah, Jay's been a great asset. He's, really? he's, him and Mick have worked together. It, not only that, but you know, Jay's doing all the video stuff for what we what we are doing. We're doing the the sound, and Jay's doing all the video. But he's uh, he's been a great asset to the man. De definitely help help Mick out uh, mm -hmm. in changing from liquids to uh, uh, to uh, digital. Uh, they're still at it just about every week, right, Mick? Hello. Can you hear me? If you speak up louder, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, I can. I can get closer to the there mic. There we go. Get closer to the mic. Oh, yeah. Now I'm sorry. Can. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I'm saying that that Jay was a, a, a great asset to the band. He he helped you put the uh, digital side together, and the filming and whatnot you've, you've been doing. I know uh, now he's doing a lot of the. Uh, Slide type stuff, right, I think. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Well, very cool. Very cool. I had a feeling it had, it had evolved over the years. So uh, thanks for the and detail. Mick is very, very, very in tune. In the studio, uh, after rehearsal, Mick's with us all the time, you know, at rehearsal. And he visualizes, when he hears a song, he's always visualizing something. So I'm in the studio and I changed the guitar solo, right? So I'm going down one day I, w w instead of going up. So I, I'm playing a note going down and he stops me and goes, Rich, you can't go down. You have to play up. The lights are going up that way, you know? So, uh, so he's really, uh, really in tune with us, man. To, to, uh, yeah, he's already in the plane, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was flying the plane. That's right. We, we, had a fuel. <laughs> we had, if we did, you know, so I, yeah. Uh, that's that's how close it is i think i'm the only one that gets to see the light show because i face center stage so i can kind of look up and see some of the stuff he's doing it's great i know. can't see it nobody can else can see, see it well, i don't see it I don't, on stage i don't get to see it hey, you're too close yeah you're too close but i'll never forget the, the the one time you know every venue was different so they're not really set up to have the entire backdrop be covered in a white curtain so, so some places are better suited for it than others. And the first, I, was, I don't know, three or four gigs in, that was perfect setup and they didn't have smoke or everything just worked right. His distance was good, all of that. And we were, we were on the tour bus watching, you know, as we're driving from one town to the next, watching the, you know, the, basically the dailies, if you want to call them that, from the night before. And it was perfect. And everybody on the bus was like, whoa, look at that. Because <laughs> the timing was perfect when the, the crescendo of the music met with the crescendo of the lights. And you could and really see it was really live and vivid. Uh, the thing that we have on the website is like that from the Wildly Theater. They had a beautiful system. There. It really is. It's just like, whoa, you can't believe it. Uh, you know, I experienced it back in the 70s when I played at the Capitol Theater and the Palladium. Um, of course, things were enhanced then. I was enhanced. Uh, <laughs> was everybody. Um, everybody was enhanced. Everybody back then. was enhanced. But man, there was one time at the Capitol Theater, boy, that I thought that whole place was just floating away. Anyway, so it was pre it's pretty cool to see, be part of it and see it, you know, the first the first time and the, the, the new version of it. So anyway. Awesome. Well, it definitely takes it to a whole different level. You know, it's just much more than just a concert, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, 
every time we play, it's different. It's, yeah. It's We're just saying never, that today. Never, ever exactly the same. Yeah. It can't be. It's, it's always it's never the same. Right. <laughs> well, it's a song that's, I think that's because we're basically a jam band. A, a lot of we're listening to all this music, and it's different every night. There's something going on that's different every night. We were mixing today a, a version. Uh, no, what it was is that Jay brought by a video of Orion uh, that we did of Desolation Valley that Ronnie sang. What a jam that was. It was great, but every time is different. And that's, that's really important, you know? So we, we keep that percentage of jam ability, if that's a word to, to keep us fresh. So every show, right. It's different. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was actually very surprised. Desolation Bali was so good. It was, it was a real nice jam and we all came in at the right parts. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> we did it. We did it. Awesome. <laughs> Well, I was thought we'd take a peek at your discography, and uh, if you could share some memories of recording each album, that would be great. And if you guys weren't on a particular album, but you know, owned it and loved it, you know, chime in and tell us what you love about it. So, uh, well, it the, the mixing uh, process of yeah. Journey, uh, where we taped sheets of paper and laid them across. Well, actually, it was a roll. We wrote out every track every fader uh, and what came in where and scrolled it across the mixer while it was being mixed because it was a a, a one shot deal 45 minutes you oh know. wow yeah it was all one piece of music yeah it was one nice. piece till it got cut in half because it had to go on vinyl and then we had to where the hell do we cut it right if we cut it in front of the dream we lose the impact, uh, and we can't cut it after the dream. That would make side one too long. So they decided to cut it after the first verse, but they didn't crossfade it. So therefore, uh, half of the second verse is missing every time you go to play it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> they didn't rectify that until they did the SACD. 50 years later <laughs> and uh, even then it wasn't a great a great splice but they just literally had to cut the album in half and that sucked <laughs> yeah we played the entire album in one shot live we only had eight tracks so we did we did the whole 45 minutes live and then we overdubbed we used every inch of space on the other mm -hmm. four tracks yeah. That's what he's talking about with the mixer. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. that was intense. Well, I put together a little PowerPoint thing, so it'll, it'll be like we're in the boardroom or something here. Cool. There you go. Can you see cool. that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. There we go. So oh, look at that. Episode number 50. Thanks again for coming by. Sure. Uh, my golden anniversary. All right. So, yeah, this is the first album, 1971. And, and where did you record this one at? DJ Dex Studio in Stone. That's the same gentleman that uh, did all those great albums for the Scorpions, isn't he? Right, right. Thought so. Yeah, we knew the Scorpions. Yeah, Actually, yeah. They, they they play the supporting gig with us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 where was it? Hanover. We played in Hanover, mm -hmm. and uh, they they were our support band. They were a good band, man. They were a good band. They are. In fact, our. Our uh, German tour manager became their tour manager. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and when, when they came here, um, we went backstage. I don't remember. Were you with us, Ron? I was yeah, it was Spectrum. Yeah, we, we went backstage and I said... Yeah, the Spectrum, yeah. Yeah. Because I, 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 I was I talking to the bass player and I said, I, I don't remember you. Are, you. are you new? He said, yeah, I've only been playing with the band 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think they've swapped out people. I think they still have the two guitar players, well, you know, in the singer. But I think every, the rhythm section is different. Yeah. I think Michael left, right? I think so. Huh? You know, it's been a while. You know, I was really into them when I was a teenager. As a matter of fact, the first concert I ever went to was the Scorpions um, back in 1984. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my first concert was, Sean? 
Uh, Bill Haley in the comments. That's pretty damn cool. You know, I still love that album. You know, Rock Around the Clock has got a bitchin' guitar solo. Yeah. Uh, you know, for it was a great movie as well. Oh yeah. Blackboard Jungle. Yeah. Yes. Lulu. So what else do you want to hear about uh, Journey? Well, just tell me how you guys kind of wrote that particular piece, how it came together. Um, it started with Astronaut's Nightmare. Yeah. And then we were looking for a storyline, and we each had bits uh, that we'd wrote over the years, and we pieced it together. Very similar, actually, out to how I pieced uh, the other side together. We, all our albums. Yeah, we had a, more of a concept but, idea. What's that? Uh, yeah, the concept. Well, you already idea. had a concept idea. It yeah. was going to be a space opera. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to do the space opera, which is what we did. And there's bits in there from different eras, um, and it just built up to what it was, to what it uh, ended up being. You know. If we hadn't um, met up with Carl Heinz Stockhausen, we wouldn't have got as far as we did. Yeah, that this part part of that is definitely influenced by Stockhausen. Um, is the um, cover art is that inspired by 2001 by chance? No, not really. No, not really. Um, Ernst Steingasser took that picture, uh, and that is his wife's eye, I think. Who? I think, uh, Ernst Steingasser, that the, was the photographer who did a lot of our uh promo stuff back then oh, because it worked for free, and we like that. I thought it was somebody related to the band. No, no. No. Ernst Steingasser is the guy who, okay. who took that picture. I mean, I somebody swiped him from the time is what I meant. Yeah. The whole concept and title of the, of the album was misunderstood when they did the cover and when they were writing the title. It should have been a capital I, the dot of which was an I. Okay. All visual is the journey to the center of yourself. Sure. So if you think of it like that, it, it actually makes more sense. It does, actually. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, that was lost in translation. Yeah. And it became E Y E, and and an I, and we had a great burning eye to finish up the album too, as that was also put in towards the end. We were stuck for the longest time after the dream sequence. We never had an ending. We just go straight into good day at gigs, you know. <laughs> so it took a while to get the very end. Okay, cool. All righty. And then uh, next up is a tab in the ocean. That's pure crap, that one. The tab in the ocean was done at, again at, in Stonholm at uh, Dieter Dirk studio. And he just expanded the back of the studio so we each had our own cubicle um, to play in because he wanted the separation. And uh, we would look through the window and wave it to each other, you know. And uh, that's where we did Tab in the Ocean. And Tab just came together, you know. The, uh, I can tell you that we had, we had a place in Seaheim where we lived and that we had this little uh, room. It was probably 10 by 10. I don't think it was any bigger than that. And we put all the gear in there and we would rehearse. And when we rehearsed, um, when we did uh, King of Twilight and Crying in the Dark, that place just throbbed. <laughs> it's the only word for it. The whole place throbbed. And I, I felt back then that we had something special just from the feeling in that room, you know. And that's where we rehearsed, we, we wrote a lot of this stuff, uh, Tab in the Ocean, and, and a lot of the stuff from Sounds Like This as well. So uh, is, is it a tab of acid? Oh, that, yeah. I figured. Okay. All right. And tell me about the album cover art. Um, Venska. Helmut Venska. Helmut Venska is a German artist who... Um, Thinks the way we do, you know. He was, he's he's still my friend after all these years. You think that way? Oh, he's definitely. I I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, he has shit, man. he has some incredible uh, ideas. Incredible. And he was an incredible this, artist. Uh, huh? He was an incredible artist. 
Yeah, incredible artist. He, he can't paint anymore. He has a really bad arthritis. But he did the la the latest cover um, on the other side is, is one of Helmut's. Excellent. I think it's probably the last one he's, he, he did. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. And uh, what would you say is the standout on this one? The tab suite or? I like it all. Yeah. It depends what you like. Yeah. You we always include a piece of tab in the ocean, whether it's tab in the ocean or whether it's D jam king of twilight or desolation valley. There's always a piece a tab in the ocean in our sets. Oh, yeah. uh, it's I, I believe it's a very special album. Oh yeah, definitely. Can't beat a better opener to a concert than a tab in the ocean. Oh, yeah. You know, we used to start off with, uh, with the D Jam King of Twilight a lot yeah. of times. Really? Yeah. Hey, yeah. because you could tune up during the intro. Yeah, you could tune up in the intro. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All righty. And then the next one sounds like this. Now, this one was a little different, wasn't it? Kind of more improv based. Am I right? Uh, you uh, know, the thing actually, is, we had a lot of music album. and we didn't know where to put it. We, we were working towards... Uh, um, remember the Future. Remember the Future. We're working towards Remember the Future, and we got all this material that we needed to put somewhere and get it out of the way. So we decided to do two concerts at, in Stommel at the studio, um, and we set up as if it was a stage, including the PA, and we had a competition and had some of the local fans come to be the audience. And we just played two days. Uh, and the music is on uh, uh, Sounds Like This. That's, that's exactly what it was. It was moving all the music onto that so we got somewhere to go. I'll tell you a story about the cover, which uh, many people don't know. Uh, the cover of the anthology, one that just came out, was supposed to be sounds like this cover. And um, Helmut told me this uh, fairly recently. And uh, the Bellaphone and Peter Hauke decided, now nah, we really want Venska to, uh, to paint the cover. So he, uh, they called up Venska and they said, we'd like you to do the new cover for sounds like this. And uh, I almost said, okay, I can do that. He said, there's only one problem. We need it tomorrow. <laughs> so Benske painted that overnight from scratch, overnight. Uh, absolutely amazing. Amazing artist. I mean, who would think of something like that? Amazing. Not me. No, not me either. It's awesome. It is great, though. Yeah, that's and a great For the cover. time... If you look at your little cutouts of you guys, if you really look at it closely, you can tell somebody's in there with the, they had the photographs and then went in with a pair of scissors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then yeah. So, that, yeah. that, yeah. that uh, picture that's, that's there was from a, uh, a, a studio thing we did in Berlin with Jay Tuck. And that was the, uh, that, that's where that come from. That's where those images are from? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. You had long hair the, then. And if you look at the way the eye comes out the top, it's very Escher. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you remember yeah. Escher? It's very Escher. Awesome, awesome cover. One of my favorite covers. Yeah. Now, was all the music on this fresh, or was there some live versions of songs from the previous two records? No, it was, it was, all, it was fresh. all fresh. It was all fresh. I thought so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it went a little bit of Beatles in there, too. Yeah. Norwegian Wood was in there. That's right. That's right. Two day dawning, yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, they were all songs that we'd been playing uh, that were self composed, but they didn't fit on Journey to the Center of the Eye or Tab in the Ocean. Okay. So basically, uh, we had all these songs that we're playing at live gigs that people liked Good Day, One, Two, Three, Four, New Day Dawning. Uh, we thought we could make an album out of the whole thing live. And on top of that, we added Wings, which was uh, also came about around the time we went in the studio for that. 
So, uh, yeah, this, that would have been our first album had we not done Journey. Yeah, but uh, New Day Dawning came from the Boston tape too. Yeah, 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 and Candlelight should have been on there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, very interesting. Okay, that first album was uh, really the Boston tape. Uh, Remember the future. Yeah. Remember the future was the first album that we did that was not done at D to DX. We did it in Chippy Norton in uh, in England. Um, and I'll tell you a little story about uh, about Remember the Future. When we were writing Remember the Future, and we 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 had pieces of it. We had Bluebird. We had pieces that uh, we were ready to put together. And we went up to Bellaphone, and the cover was sitting on top of the uh, um, um, on top of one of the desks. And if you look at the back of Remember the Future, you'll see the Bluebird. And we said, shit, that's the connection right there. <laughs> and uh, the the story of Remember the Future, uh, some of it was instigated by Frankenstein, where Frankenstein's talking to the guy and he doesn't, know, he can't see him, so he's not afraid of him. I don't know if you remember that part in Frankenstein. Yeah, the blind guy. Yeah, the guy yeah, in the blind, blind house. And that's where that idea came from. So, uh, so you know. I, I converted it into the history of the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Frankenstein's castle was right where we lived. Yeah. 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 A couple True of fact. miles away from where we lived. That's what Frankenstein. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. Um, tell me a bit about the cover art for this one. It's trippy, man. Yeah, yeah. man. Ben, Upside cool. down. Yeah. Well, you place. know, it's interesting you say that because a lot of people have taken that image of the whatever you call this guy, I call him Butterfly Man, and then flipped them around, you know, and you and used it for various different things. Like they photoshopped them out. So they take, you know, everything out of there except him and the wings, flipped them around. And it, it, to me, it doesn't work oh. because he had intended it to be upside down. Mm -hmm. Right side up, he doesn't work. Right, but, but uh, I won't mention the name of the company that's done that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it uh, looks like he's kind of falling from grace in an Icarus yeah. kind of way. Right, there right, go. exactly. He's grasping onto the throbbing eye, you know. <laughs> I got to tell you, I look at that and I think Benchka. Yep. You know, I, I don't, I don't try and and make it work. I look at it and it works. And if you look at the back of the album, that works too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the, the picture in the middle is um, what was the picture in the middle there? I was thinking of something different just then. Yeah, I don't remember. But now maybe it didn't have a middle. This one, right? This was just the two sides. But I, I, the, as I said, Bluebird's on the back. So that's the one you pull out of the record collection and go. You got to at least give it a listen. You got to hear what this sounds like, right? I mean. Yeah. This this album was album of the year in uh, Germany. Yeah. Now, is this the one that kind of broke you in America as well? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Tell me a bit more about that, and who did you tour with once you got over here? Mm. The first tour we toured on our own the whole the whole time. Wow. Tell them about St. Louis. Yeah, we played. Uh, Ron Powell was the uh, the promoter that put the whole tour together. And he and Shelley Graf, Grafman, who owned KC Radio, they played the hell out of this record. And we, uh, we went in um, to do, we did two days, two days at the Ambassador Theatre, two shows a day, 3,000 people a show. So that's 12,000 people. Uh, saw us the on the first two a play on our own. We had a, a stereo PA that we brought over. We brought all our gear over, and uh, the sound was great. And we did uh, I don't know how many dates we did, but we did quite a lot. Um, and and then uh, when we came back, uh, I think we played with some other people when we came back. But that the first tour we did we played with nobody. We played on our own. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Was that like a coast to coast thing? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, and back in the seventies, the, the, this KC radio in St. Louis played the heck out of it. Like it yeah. was it, a, a lot more than the New York or LA stations did. And when I played with the band, the first tour I did with them, we, we played, we went to go play in St. Louis. And I mean, there were people waiting outside the club at two o'clock in the afternoon with the record albums in their hands. It's the closest, it's the most exuberant rabbit fan base I've ever seen. And then we just, we sold out four nights in St. Louis back in, uh, in January. I mean, it's, I, I tell this to everybody that, that St. Louis is to Nectar like Asbury Park is to, to Springsteen or okay. Cleveland is to Rush. I mean, that's their, their, their biggest fan base is, yeah. is there. It's just it's amazing. Yeah, the, the first gig sold out in two hours. Uh, yeah. uh, and we, actually, they're looking to book us back uh, in May, I think, uh, <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, five or six concerts they're going to do. Um, in, we don't know when, but it's, it's in May if this COVID thing goes away. They, uh, they, they love us there. It's amazing. It's great. You all right there, Sean? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm here. The host just disappeared. I'm kind of a Midwestern guy myself. I grew up in Topeka, which is about an hour outside of Kansas City. So, Topeka? yeah, I'm familiar with KC. Not... Kansas City is a raunchy place to play, man. <laughs> There's not a whole lot going on there lately. A record bar, right? It was record, record bar. bar. Record bar. Was great. Yeah. great yeah. show. Yeah. There's a lot of jazz history in Kansas City, too. Yeah. Excuse me, I got to get a drink real fast. Yeah. One minute. Give me one too, Ron. All righty. So this next one, you guys, um, were you just kind of done with the epics for a while and just felt good to do a, an album that was a concept but not so long form? We we never really looked on it like that. We we uh, played what, what came out, you know, whatever happened, happened. And uh, we, uh, we decided to have a, cir a circus theme and uh, we actually did a lot of the photos at, at uh, Circus Corona in Germany. The interior is all the Nectar family uh, at that That's time. That's the gatefold. The gatefold, yeah, the gatefold. Um, a lot of people thought <coughs> they didn't follow Remember the Future very well. And they, they thought that Recycled should have come after uh, remember the future, but it didn't work out that way. But I find Down to Earth as popular today, more popular today than it was when we did it. Yeah, well, I think it's a great album. A lot of requests, right, Randy? Yeah, a lot of requests for uh, Show Me the Way, That's Life. Um, oh, Willie's one of my favorites from that. Yeah, yeah. Great. Tune. Yeah, there's some good songs off of that album. Oh, yeah. Um, and that, that, the picture with the bus was done in the middle of London. Okay. Wandsworth Common. Uh, wow. Where? It was top of Wandsworth Common where I used to live. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so, um, you know, this is the one that, uh, Show Me The Way was the tune that got played on the Jeffersons. I was wondering if you... Yeah, had, right, right. You guys ever meet Mr. Sherman Hemsley? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, tell us more. I know he was quite an interesting character. Um, he was definitely his, an interesting loved character. Loved his prog rock, and not just your commercial ELP Yes stuff, but he he went pretty deep. Yes, you did. You know. he, he he rolled up at our hotel. And we, we, we're staying at the Hyatt Hotel on Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. uh, which is very famous for uh, rock and roll. And uh, he showed up, and we didn't know who he was. But uh, we, we found out quickly who he was. And he announced us on, on stage one night, I remember. Santa Monica had, Civic. That's it, yeah, Santa, Monica, Santa Monica Civic. You're right, Ron. And he, uh, he had a party at his house that was awesome. Yeah, in fact, yeah, uh, Sherman asked uh, uh, me and Mo to, uh, 
to be in his band. He fancied singing and he wanted to sing in Las Vegas. And he asked Mo, me and Mo to uh, uh, do something with him. But then he, he went somewhere, heard his own voice and decided against it. <laughs> That's a good move. Yeah. That's a good story, Ron. I never heard that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. That was the same thing with my singing career. As soon as I heard my own voice, nah, not so much. <laughs> Second thoughts. <laughs> that's oh. funny. Great guy, Sherman. Really yeah. nice guy. So recycled, 1975. Um, Venska and his alien. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on here? Yeah, that was Venska again. Um, that's pretty wild. Yeah, he, uh, he was actually very sick he was very sick at this time and we had to patch the cover together somewhat not the front but some of the rest of it so that it worked uh because he was too sick to do it uh we recorded this album at the chateau de horrible in france we call it the chateau de horrible oh yeah uh, you tell us you know was, some huh? great records came out of there despite oh yeah so it, it, I, I think that we did the we did the basic live tracks at uh, the Chateau, and then we took them to uh, uh, what the hell? Air Studios. Air Studios in London mm -hmm. to do the overdubs and to finish it up. Um, that was that was a great studio. Yeah, uh, you know, um, uh, the horrible. Uh, when we arrived there, Elton John was just leaving. Oh, yeah, doing his He did the honky chateau. chateau there. Yeah. And when we were leaving, Fleetwood Mac were coming in. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. I forget which one, the uh, Bear Trees, I think it was there. Oh, that's a great record. That yeah. whole era is kind of overlooked, but it was fantastic. Yeah. But it was a mess. The studio was a mess. Oh, uh, yeah. I can imagine. Spent four days rewiring the damn place. Yeah. <laughs> easy, easy. Did you guys. You know, Stay there yeah. on premises when you were recording there. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. I was freaking out because I wanted to use my timpanis on recycle, and we couldn't get them in the studio. The <laughs> doors were, were not wide enough, so the roadies came up with a a, um, a trick of uh, putting something out the window and hoisting it up. It was. I wish we would have filmed it. It was so. Funny. Did you really have to do that? Jeez. Yeah. You and that timpani, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they were the big timpanis that I had. I, I had a set of four timpanis, and they went up to 40-inch. Wow. You know, from 28 to 40, you know. Jesus. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the big, they were big. They were big. But, yeah, that was funny, you know, getting the timpanis up um, with a rope, uh, you know, like, just like a farmer would. It was funny. Yeah, great road crew. They were determined <laughs> because I was determined to use it, and they made it. They did it. They made it happen. Yeah, I bet, I'm sure Pete had a lot to do with it. Pete, Pete oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the road crew that's got a lot of engineering. Um, I don't know if he's got an engineering background, but he's got an engineering mind, and he's very, very clever. When we go to pack the van, when we go on the road, nine times out of ten, the stuff just doesn't fit with a timpani and a B3 and the rest of it. And, and basically the band goes, okay, well, we'll, we'll be in the hotel. Let us know when it's time to go. And then Pete sits there and he figures all that shit out. So I would imagine Pete was involved with uh, the hoist. Yeah, Vinny, Vinny got his farmer's driving license there at the Chateau. Uh, problem was it was three o'clock in the morning and they were drunk <laughs> out of their head and they were driving a tractor through the streets of this village. <laughs> about three yeah. in the morning all drunk yeah that's yeah. hard to believe yeah when, when we got to the studio to do recycled we actually only had a, a rough outline of a recycle the, the we, we we hadn't written the words for it and uh, we knew roughly what we wanted but the the second side we'd not got together at all we we had pieces that we pieced together and we pieced him. We did this in at the studio in in, uh, in the chateau. Um, yeah, the only one you had was Marvelous Moses, really. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. How did Larry Fast come into the fold for this one? Well, I met Larry in when I went over on to do the first tour. Um, I had to go to uh, um, 
to the record company, Passport, and I flew into uh, Kennedy, and I had no idea where Passport Records was. So I jumped in a taxi and said, take me to Plainfield. <laughs> no oh. idea where it was, man. <laughs> it was about two hours out, yeah. to, out to Plainfield. And when I got there, Larry Fast was there. And I, I met him and I listened to his music. And really, really liked his music. In fact, we took some of his music uh, to open the show from his first album. Um, Energy. Yeah, Synergy, from yeah. his Synergy album, the f very first one. Electronic Realizations, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly. Um, and Larry and I became instant friends. And when we moved over to this country, we shared a house. Uh, myself, uh, Taff, and, uh, and, and Larry, we shared a house. And uh, it just seemed natural... Uh, after listening to what he could do to bring him over to the studio, to, to uh, uh, the, the chateau, to put his synth parts on it and just listen to him. The way he built the music was incredible. Uh, when we were in, in uh, Air Studios, uh, George Martin was stood at the back of the, the studio when he, he did uh, Sao Paulo Sunrise, the... Uh, or what they call the drums, the steel drums that are on there. And we decided we wanted steel drums. So um, Laurie said, do you have a synthesizer? And the guy said, sure. And they got a synthesizer out. I think it was a Korg or something like that. And Larry sat there and he did his programming. He said, okay, I'm ready. And the guy said, uh, the engineer said, don't you want to hear it? No. Well, that's the sound. <laughs> he knew exactly what, what he programmed, yeah. you know. And you'd have heard that sound was so out of tune. He, and he built the whole organic part of the, the steel drum with all the, all the resonances and everything. He had it all in his head. George Martin was absolutely blown away. You can imagine. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's my Larry story. Very mm -hmm. cool. Very cool. All right. And um, you got any stories from then, Ron? Uh, only the Vangelis came and we went to Vangelis' studio, remember, in his purple taxi. <laughs> yeah, and, he loaned uh, us his tape recorder, remember? Yeah, yeah. and Demise Roussos all came around. And, uh, and then George Martin started mixing it with uh, Jeff, right? Jeff Emery. That's yeah. what, yeah, that's when Van Gallis and, Dem and uh, uh, Demise was in the studio too. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Demise Roussas. He's a very, very big singer. Well, before he passed, very, very big uh, um, kind of schlager singer. But we knew him in Athens with Van Gallis. He was a bass player in the band. And he was a great singer. He had that like rough voice, Motown stuff. Mm -hmm. So when me and Mo was playing with him, it was great. Uh, Demise was doing other stuff, you know, play guitar. It was great, really great. We had some good times on, um, what was it? The Hilton, I think we played in Athens. In Copacabana. Copacabana on the yeah. rooftop. Yeah, yeah I've got fantastic. pictures of that, yeah. And yeah, uh, was, Frank Ellis wanted me and Ron to join him in Aphrodite's Child. Yeah. And, and Demi you, was going to be the singer, you know. Yeah. Did you tour the States for this one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we toured. I think uh, Pavlov's dog toured with us on this one, right? Yeah, but I don't think they did Canada with us, did they? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, they did the West Coast, I remember. Yeah. yeah they did and and Keel. We did Keel Auditorium in. Uh, yeah. In St. Louis. Yeah. Like two nights there. Pavlov's dog. They should have covered one less bell to ring. That would have been funny. <laughs> 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 no, I had the play of folks drooling over it. That's right. There you go. Um, okay, so ah. things changed a bit. Um, what inspired Roy to leave at this time, and what did you do to compensate once he was out of there? 
what Peter Gabriel had done with Genesis, I think Roy wanted to do himself. Uh, he just he just followed his girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's it what he was doing. I mean, he was definitely just following his girlfriend. Yeah, and um, I think he had the promise of uh, somebody promised to make him a solo artist. You know, uh, uh, you know, big kit, a big artist, whatever. Yeah, so, yeah I think it was his uh, girlfriend mostly. Right. So how did yeah. you feel about that at the time? Uh, what is it to feel about? You're in the you're in a country. You suddenly, I mean, he, he just announced he was leaving and left. Uh, we just built a big stage show, uh, so we weren't very happy about it. Sure. But you got to deal with it. We we put an advertisement out. We had a rehearsal studio in New York City, and we went through two hundred guitarists. Wow. And some of them couldn't even play. They just wanted to see us. <laughs> uh, and the the guy who that. was head and shoulders above anybody else was David Nelson. Uh, he was just so much better than all the others. And so we decided to uh, to have him, well, him uh, play in the band. And we, we uh, went out to New Jersey and we rehearsed and wrote the music for Magic as a Child. And then we uh, went to the House of Music to record it. We couldn't really afford to have prime time, but we had all night, every night. Um, and uh, that's what we recorded. The girl on the front is Brooke Shields. Yeah, that's what I heard, a very young Brooke Shields. She was 13, I think, at the time. Wow. Mom yeah, I think uh, when, when Dave joined the band, we were under the gun because... Uh, we had a gig book for New Year's Eve. That's right. On, and um, he had to learn the whole program in two weeks. Wow. And what yeah. you what you hear on the live show that's been released. Um, the Hofstra. Yeah, the Hofstra. Yeah. That's the show. Yeah, and that's the show. He just, that, did, he just yeah. did an incredible job. I don't know. I couldn't have done it personally. Not in two oh, weeks. He just, he, yeah. just, he just walked all over it. It was yeah. unbelievable. The entire repertoire, the whole gig. Yeah, yeah, we didn't tell him about the light show, and we didn't tell him about the flash pods or the dry oh. ice. <laughs> so we're on stage, and suddenly the dry ice came on stage, and he couldn't see his foot pedals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Freaked out. And he was freaking out. I, I, st I went to stand at the side of him to give him some uh, moral uh, help, you know, to get him through it. And then when the flash, I said, don't look out front. Look back, look back. <laughs> flash pods went off. He would have been blind for, for a minute. So was this whole record written after Roy departed, or were you already kind of halfway done with it when he nope. gave them? it was all written after he. The only song that we yes, had the only one on here was Listen. Yeah. Uh, that was the only song on there that we, uh, we had when we started it. Okay. Well, I think it's a really cool album. I think um, it's a strong album, and it kind of shows that you guys can definitely be Nectar without Roy around. You know, so I, I think it's a really good record. I actually prefer it to the one that followed it. This one here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think me and Ron weren't on that. We left. Okay, so this was uh, one of Roy's uh, creations, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Alrighty. So, and then after that, although although I have to say that we we we'd already written "Man in the Moon" before he did that. Not not the songs, but the actual title track. Yeah, the title track and, and already, a lot of already from, wrote that. from various albums that he did over the years. We wrote in Munich uh, before we left, and he uh, he put them on the album. Hmm. Uh, okay. And this was the last one for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. So between this and this, um, fill me in uh, briefly on uh, what you all did. We weren't involved in either of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to You weren't say. involved in Prodigal Sun, right, Ron? No, no. No, we, didn't, we weren't involved in either one of them albums. All right, well, we'll just keep moving on then. What did you guys spend most of the 80s and 90s doing? Any other bands uh, or anything? Paying bills. 
I was doing, <laughs> I was doing plumbing and heating. <laughs> I was doing yeah. order, buddy. Yeah. I did. I got into uh, air conditioning and heating, and then after that, audio video. You were playing a lot with Supreme Court then, were you, Ron? Wasn't that? Oh, your... well, I was. I never stopped playing. In the, in the world, didn't you play? I with never you? stopped playing at yeah. all. Oh, I mean, I play local gigs and stuff like that, but no, no I mean, I never. I, as far as uh, on the nectar level, no, I never played. Okay. I yeah. Ron's a, a serious session drummer, man. <laughs> I, I stopped what? playing altogether. I, I didn't play right up until we did Neopass. So 26 years. I played a little bit on a party or played a little bit here, but I went down and jammed with Ron. But it's not the same when you're playing on, on this level. Uh, you've got to really peak, you know. When it came time to learn all that stuff for Nearfest, how, how quick did it come back to you? Um, we started, we, I think Mick put a CD together with Eddie, right? Yeah. Uh, put a CD together of all the songs we were going to play. And we each had to learn our parts, refresh where we were. Uh, we started in January and every Sunday, uh, myself, Ron, uh, Taff, and occasionally Larry would get together in New Brunswick at a place that Ron found uh, for us to rehearse. Was Larry with us on that or not? I don't remember. Uh, no. It was just us, right? Yeah. So we we rehearsed and we rehearsed uh, the girls uh, a little bit later, and and uh, the guy who played percussion, Scott. I had them at my house and we rehearsed backing vocals and whatnot. And then uh, a week before we did Neofest, Roy came over and we played every day. I mean, I, I, uh, I equate it. Somebody asked me what it was like doing that. And I said, well, imagine you can play tennis and imagine it's January and you've got to get better. And imagine in June you're playing Wimbledon. <laughs> right. Because that's that's the difference uh, in the uh, in the in in the power. I mean, when when we went on in Neofest, it just felt like we'd never never been away, oh, right, Ron? It was just yeah, yeah. it was just magic. It just felt yeah. great. Had you, either one of you been in touch with Roy much leading up to that? In the years? No, I had not. No. Roy called me up and he said. Uh, how would you like to uh, do a gig? And uh, I said, okay, let's do it. Um, uh, I guess he called everybody else, right, Ron? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember exactly, but I know he called me and he said, do you want to do a gig? We've got, a, we've got an offering of a gig. And I said, yeah, let's do it. So how did it feel that first day when you all got together and played together for the first time in all those years? It was good. Awesome, awesome. Awesome feeling, yeah. Really good vibe all the way around. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Well, that was a great show. I was just, I'm glad they filmed it too because there were so many high points. I remember you guys uh, did Recycled twice. because mm -hmm. the first Yeah, was... the beginning of it because they, they, they missed it. They didn't have, it, had the film loaded. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was definitely worth getting getting the second time. So yeah. All right. Well, let me dip back into this presentation a bit here and uh, take a peek at some of these ones from the two thousands. Uh, if any of you are on these, let me know, or we'll just keep uh, rolling here. So he kind of did that one pretty much on his own, I think. Right. And then how about this one, Evolution? That was with Ron, wasn't it? No, yeah. Evolution. Randy was on that. That was yeah. the first one I did. Yeah. Randy, Ron, Taft and Roy, right? Yeah. 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 Now, were that, these was all... a really, that was a really good album. I really like that album. There's some songs on there, I think there are, are like, um, for me, like there's a song called Mother Earth. And um, I was just sat next to Tap in the studio and he just composed the middle bit, the yeah, orchestration right. of it. And he just did it on the spot and it was unbelievable. It was just... My heart just went out. It was unbelievable. Every time I hear it, it's such a uh, a perfect part. I, I can't explain it. You have to check it out yourself. But 
Okay. And then how about this one? This is the one you did with Billy Sherwood. Am I right? Yeah. Now, what does this Billy was, Sherwood uh, know about Nectar? Oh, he was a big fan of Nectar. He really oh, liked Nectar. Excellent. Um, yeah, we did this in his uh, in his garage, you know, which was converted, you know, into a, a studio. Got a great sound. I thought he got a good sound. Although the, I weren't quite happy with the drums in the end, but um, it started off a good sound. Yeah. But uh, he, the... he's definitely a guy who knows what he's doing. And if you want to do something, man, he'll have it done in one minute, you know, with the, uh, I think he used Logic Pro, but he knew it and who all, did, all the way, everything who did, about it. Who know, did the so. bulk of the writing for this one? Uh, Roy. Roy, okay. Roy, uh, I wrote one song, Klaus wrote one song, and the rest was Roy. Uh, any particular songs stand out to you now? Um, I always liked um, the thing, I, uh, you know, the beginning of, um, what's it called? Uh, the very first song, I forgot the name of it. Uh, I just like, I like that song, that was good. Although it, it, it broke up too many times for me, but Roy wanted it that way and um, so we left it, you know, it was more, uh, Roy had a lot of control there, I would say control, you know. Yeah. And Billy Sherwood was, wow, what a what a musician. He plays everything. Yeah, On my does. song, he played uh, bass, keys, and um, did a guitar solo. Great guitar solo, very emotional, and um, He's a great drummer, he's a great bass player, he's everything. Yeah, he really is. He's such a great musician, and he's a really, really nice guy. He really is. I actually had him on the show back in May, and um, yeah, it was great to go over all those old Yes stories with him. And some yeah, new I went well. to, uh, last time to play in Atlantic City, I called him up, and he, uh, he sent me a ticket, and I went down and saw him and hung out with him and the guys in Yes again. Because on the, on the when we did the cruise, I was hanging out with Alan White and uh, really like it was great. Oh yeah, such a really great guy. The guys in Yes too, they're very nice. Yeah, they sure are. Yeah, this is a great album cover. I think this one kind of harkens back to some of the the best ones. You know. I don't think it's one of the best albums we've done, but um, I think um, more modern. You know, yeah. recording. You know, the Billy had a a different touch, yeah, than what we were used to. Oh, yeah. Sure. In production, you know. Yeah. But it is what it is. Yeah. So that leads us to the most Yay! recent. Yeah. <laughs> this is the one. <laughs> Everybody. The important, this is the important one. Yeah. Now, you said earlier that most all of this was written in the 70s, or was it a mixture of new stuff and 70s stuff? Mainly written in the 70s, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Seven, seventy-eight, maybe? 78? Yeah, right after Magic is a Child. I know, right. I know Dave just uh, finished that tour, and I I uh, came from the House of Music as well, and uh, and we played a couple of those songs, and we uh, we wrote a lot of that stuff. I think three-quarters of the record was, was written in 78. Yeah. yeah. They had these tapes that that I'd never heard them before. Well, what happened there? Oh, I'm back. I thought I had just... Uh, oh, oh, okay. Um, last one. <laughs> they they had these tapes from from the skin that they did. Cassettes. At, cassettes. Where was it? The Palace? Or the, or? Oh, no, no, no. We, we played at a place what? in New England called Player's Tavern. Player's Tavern. That's what it was. Yeah. So they, they had these tapes that they got digitized. And they said, all right, so we're going to get send these... These files through Dropbox, and then you know, listen to this, and this is where we're going to be. So these were cassette tapes from the board in 1978. So how many of your tapes do you listen to from 1978 that weren't, you know, pre-recorded things? It was for me anyway, guys. It was like, what the f are they? Yeah, it was more muscle here? memory for us. And then, but I, you know, I. The kind of when we finally got together, they're like, oh, yeah, it was this, 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 and this. Like, oh, wow, God, that's actually really cool. So, it, and it wasn't verbatim what they, they had played that got taken and then done. But 
but but major parts. Nectar writes songs in, in parts. There's, there's this bit and there's that bit, and then you find boxes the string, like we string call it in boxes, and they string it all together, which is I think a lot of people do that. But anyway, that's the, the, it, it was done in those different gigs and those different in that house in Chatham. They came up with those parts, and we sort of modernized it a bit, I guess. Would you say that, Mo? Rich? Yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely. I I, yeah, I think uh, this band's got its own stamp. You know. It, it just it merges well. We play well together, and there's no ego involved. It's the, I like this bit, I like that bit. Let's play this, let's play that, and it's all for one, one for all. And that's the album sounds fresh, mainly because we played the whole damn thing live, like we always did. Awesome. Yep, we set up uh, in, in a big circle. It's a big room, big analog wooden room, and. Uh, we played. We awesome. we just played solos and everything. We just yeah. we just played it out and uh, overdubbed some some other guitars and some vocals, but but uh, just like like old school stuff, like real that's why, basic bed tracks. Yeah, that's uh, why it has that energy because that yeah, it's coming from that time and you know just brought it to life now with some sprinklings of other things in there. Right. But if if you look at drifting which I think is one of the most powerful songs on the album. Uh, that was first take live. Very we nice. just blew it out. And then we added, the only thing we added was the keyboard, that piano thing that's under the vocal. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and the vocal. Yeah. That was it. That's all we'd overdo, overdubbed. Everything else stayed the way it was. And it just felt that way in the studio. It just felt great. Because right, right. it's hard to tap back into it when, once you're so revved up live. And it's kind of, I don't know, Sean, if people are doing this kind of stuff still, but I know it's hard to tap back into a live energy. Everything sounds pasted on, you know? So if you're really jamming and in that moment, there's nothing like it. You know, it just feels, feels like it's supposed to feel. Sure. Uh, and, and so, so it, it worked for us. It's, we're, I, I'm very blessed to, uh, to be here and to get the feeling and this blissful thing that I have. And I think with that, we all are, we all are. And the crowds are really liking it live uh, and um, it's getting good reviews. Uh, so uh, we're all very blessed. Well, I think it's awesome. Well, thank you all for being part of the show and uh, taking the time to fill me in on the history of Nectar and then some. Um, anything you wanna share with the audience before we uh, wrap it up here? Just that we've got the big, um, the big live streaming concert that's coming on December fifth. That's, that's the, basically the best of 2020 from our life on the road. Um, the, the, the links for that have not been yet determined, but it will be soon. So if people just check our website, nectarsmusic.com. We'll have that. We're giving that away free because we had, you know, had planned to do the live concert, and then it just. It, better not to do it at this yeah. point all being in a room together so it's just difficult to do that so and the uh, venues that are streaming it uh we've decided to waive our fee and just let them put out their own tip jar and help them and help the venues nice you know, yeah, so no, yeah. uh, we've got a couple of people i guess bearsville is going to do it um who else the orion i think Right. They're, they're gonna stream it as well. Reggie's so, is gonna stream it. Reggie's oh. in Chicago. Which you ever been to Reggie's in Chicago? Best. No. Oh. Great place. Great place. It's awesome. it, when it all comes back, you gotta get down. That's that place is the bomb. Think, isn't that where they have a Prague Fest of some sort every year? Too? That's right. That's right. Yeah, 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 I think so. What a place. Yeah. yeah. A cool place. You'll see. You'll see on the uh, uh, show that we've been putting together. Uh, you'll see the different venues uh, that we played and we tried to get the uh, uh, ambience of the music to be sort of even so it sounds like one concert okay um it's it's, it's going to be interesting that definitely going to be so it's two and a half hours long okay so it's not okay. it's not a two minute concert you know. December 5th. All right. Well, that will December be a, 5th, a, right. a it's holiday be a, treat. It's going to be available for three days okay. so that no matter what time zone you're in, you can listen to it. And if you want to listen to it two or three times, listen to it. Go for it. I, I think it's too big to download. This, uh, 
It's massive file. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But so maybe maybe at some point we'll uh, we'll put it out as a DVD. I don't know yet. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, do it. We'll do it, yeah. Very cool. Go on, it, it goes out for uh, save the st save our stages as well. Yeah, so uh, yeah, save yeah, our stages. Yeah. A good cause, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna do actually a little uh, similar to what we're doing now or next week uh, with the uh, prog stock uh, for that. What they call it? Stage it. Save, save our, stage. our stages. Stage it. Yeah, stage. We're, we're gonna do a little chat there. I don't know whether it's gonna be as long as this one, but. Um, we, we're trying to put something together with the uh, with the prog stock people, you know. When this is uh, all over, we got to have somewhere to be able to play. Yeah. Yeah. When this all blows over, we have we to. We want to go um, fast. In the meantime, yeah. we have to kind of kiss up to the venues now. I guess that's what we're doing. Come to Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. We like some prog down here. I'm going to tell you when. Is that when where you are, Atlanta. Yeah. 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 yeah it, cool. That was a plan, but we'll yeah, there, we were. You know, uh, we were uh, definitely want to go there. Uh, definitely i'll definitely be there when you make it so thank you. Right. you have a very unique uh show sean you know thank you for letting us uh well, thank you it was very cathartic for us as well because you you know it's on it's on the uh fly and it uh thank you yeah well my pleasure you know i love to go deep on these subjects and and i like it when when like guys in the band learn something about the band they're in they didn't yeah. know oh yeah 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 so that's always yeah. fun too yeah. i learned <laughs> ron's I first name today tonight. it was awesome <laughs> uh, Ron's if, ready for bed now. Yeah. yeah. If is there any chance we can get a copy of this? Are you recording it, right? Well, I'm going to upload it to my YouTube page, and I'll send you a link to that. And if you could That'd share that on your social media, I would love it. Yeah, that would be great. The more yeah. the merrier. Alrighty. Well, next week I have a two shows. I have a show Friday afternoon. I'm chatting with Sticks drummer Todd Sukerman. Yeah. So, nice. Oh, you know, great drummer. Cool. That's right. So come sail away on Friday afternoon and we'll uh, with him. And then uh, Saturday, one of the brightest talents on the prog scene these days, Randy McStein, guitar yeah. player. He's got a great new um, duo with Marco Miniman. Yes. Oh, wow. So uh, it's, uh, they have I've a new album. That's real good. Yeah, their first album was great. That was back in May. I chat with them and they've already done another one. And it's it's even cooler. It's more diverse, um, almost kind of Zappa esque in spots, and that's wow. always a good cool. thing. So, and also, if you haven't seen that new Zappa documentary, by all means, check it out. It is yes, fantastic, yeah. and it's really a biography. It's not like talking about every band lineup. It's more about his life. So, yeah, cool. and we we played with Zappa in Europe. Oh gosh, that must have been amazing. It was amazing. absolutely amazing. Oh. Every night, we, we did the whole of Europe with Zappa, with the Overnight Sensation Band. Oh, wow. Yeah, I would have been out there watching them every night. <laughs> yeah, we were. Hey, uh, we they were that. watching us. Oh, it was, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's Zappa cool. was a big fan. Well, he had great taste. <laughs> uh, good All deal. Right. I'm going to sign off. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, roll. Yeah. Stay yeah, safe. Thanks, man. All thanks, right, have guys. Day. Happy holidays. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, same Thank to you everybody. Very much, John. Right, Thank man. you. Take care. Be safe. Thank Thanks, you very man. much. My pleasure. Good night. See you soon. Mm -hmm.